gotten some things since I set up this overlay pretty quick and I'm not very good at setting up overlays, but here we are. Uh, welcome to, I just wanna make sure my closed captions are working. They are, great. Uh, welcome, I'm gonna plan some stuff and learn about Eberron and you all are gonna join me on this journey, whether you like it or not. No, just kidding, that's not at all true. If you don't wanna be here, you don't have to be. I do have to fix something though, because I just realized that this number is wrong. Someone else followed me, so we only have 11 more followers needed until I hit 50, which is very exciting. Um, cool. So, what do we have? Uh, I'm gonna have some stuff up here on the screen. I've got two documents that you can see right now. I'm not gonna put the Eberron Rising from the Last War stuff up on here because uh, because I don't, I think you should go buy the book and I don't want to, wizards to get mad at me for uh, displaying their IP. That said, uh, we'll definitely talk about stuff that's in the book. I may read parts of the book aloud um, if that becomes a useful thing to do. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm, uh, is this what I wanted? Yes. I'm familiar-ish with Eberron. I've played in a couple of campaigns in Eberron, but both of them, um, both of them, I joined in after they had already started with long-established gaming groups. Um, and by long-established gaming groups, I mean the group that I am currently planning this for. Um, so uh, I want to learn a little bit more. Hey, Ish, how you doing? So I want to learn a little bit more about the world as I go. Uh, if any of you here in the channel hanging out right now are more knowledgeable than I about, I'm going to turn this up just a little bit, more knowledgeable than I about Eberron, please feel free to hop in. Um, or if you want to learn right along with me, that is fine too. There's one other thing that I want to do. I want to just add, I want to see if I can can do this. Um, no, that's not what I wanted. Well, that's okay. Um, right, so that's sort of uh, what we're doing today. Uh, so let's get started. The first thing that I want to do is I'm going to uh, gonna put out a list of the characters uh, that are gonna, uh-oh, I just realized that's not in frame. There it is, oh no. Oh, I understand the problem. Okay. See, I'm still learning things. Okay, there we go. That's what we want. And now I just need to adjust one other thing here. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, talk about the characters and have a little list of them uh, on the screen. It's only going to go in the bottom left uh, box, but like I said, still learning. Um, so I just need to change this input to be about this. Uh-oh. There we go, that's what we wanted. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna make the list of characters to let you all know what we're working with here. To give you a brief idea ahead of time, uh, we have decided that the party is going to be a, you know what, I'm not playing any sounds. I'm gonna take these off, is that crazy? You can see my messy hair. Um, oh, that's so much more comfortable. Um, we have decided that the party is going to be a group of operatives uh, that are working for the Boromar clan, uh, which is a crime syndicate in Sharn, um, run by a family of halflings, though we'll see in a moment, but I don't think any of our characters are halflings, um, which is fine. So yeah, this is where we'll start. Let's see, where is my Eberron, the Boromar? I titled the campaign in d and Beyond, the Boromar Buffoons. Uh, I run an Eberron campaign, I've learned a lot by running. Also, sorry, I forget that I've got all these different things and I'm not looking at the chat. So now I'm looking at the chat. Great, Ish, your advice will be greatly appreciated. Also, hi Fluffy Snowball, I'm so happy that you're here. I haven't been able to play with Eberron since 3.5, so I'm excited for all the neat things. Same, so I mentioned a little bit earlier, I've played in two brief Eberron campaigns, but both of them were 3.5. Um, and then I played in uh, an adventure, uh, the one that's in Eberron Rising from the Last War, but a very truncated version, uh, run by the phenomenal James and Chicasso. So I have some familiarity, um, although that was at sort of a party weekend, and I'm not gonna lie, I don't remember a ton from that adventure. Um, so, all right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna now, I know I've said this a million times, but we're actually going to get our characters out. 
All right, so the first character is Anastasia. I'm reading all this. I don't know who these characters are. We sort of did a session zero. We did like half of a session zero to plan uh, the players' characters last Friday. So they've built them in D&D Beyond, and so on. this is now me uh, putting them in here. This is Anastasia Noir Strull. Uh, she is, uh, oh, and I should say she, her. Uh, she is a college, uh, sorry, an elf. Let's find out what kind of elf, because we want to be thorough, right? I'm pretty sure I popped out the chat. Where did it go? Here it is. <laughs> um, okay, she is a, oh, right. I remember this now. Um, let's see. She's a Mark of Shadow elf. So I have to figure out, because I don't remember, but I need to figure out if she is a part of House Therani or House Thalarn. Um, but anyway, she is a Mark of Shadow elf, and she is a College of Glamour bard. Okay, excellent. So that's going to be one of our big questions is, why is a Mark of Shadow elf working for the Boromar clan and not for their associated dragon marked house? I can't wait to find out the answer to that. Um, all right, the next character is Esperanza Noarstral. Oh, it appears we have siblings. I do remember them talking about that, but I didn't know that they had finally decided on it. So it looks like Anastasia's sister Esperanza is with us. She too is a Mark of Shadow Elf. So I'm gonna have to find out uh, what house they're both in. And she is a, she's a monk. What kind of monk is she? Monastic tradition, ah, way, oops, that says wag, way of the long death monk. Okay, okay. I'm liking how this is shaping up. A lot of dragon marks going on. Wow. Yeah, no kidding. Um, I do think these are the only two in the campaign, and we have three, possibly four other players. So up towards of a third uh, of the party is going to be dragon marked. Although, interestingly, well, I guess Anastasia will have the spellcasting component of the subclass. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but um, part of having your dragon mark is that you get additional spells on your spell list, which Esperanza won't benefit from because she doesn't have the spellcasting feature, which is fine. Okay, the next character that we are dealing with is Sora Shana. Uh, she goes by Sora. Oh, these are all she, her. She, her. Uh, Sora Shana is a Kalashtar, or Kalashtar, however you prefer, and she is an Echo Knight fighter. So that's interesting because that is a subclass and a tradition from um, Wildmount from Exandria, uh, which I know very little about, but that's okay. I've heard it both ways. Hey, Carl, how you doing? Uh, yes, so have I. I prefer Kalashtar, uh, but, you know, say it how you will. And the last player to have something in my D&D Beyond uh, account, or in this campaign, so I'm missing one player's character, but that's okay, is Umbrus the Unseen. How mysterious. And I believe, let's see, let me just double check. Yep, that's he, him. Um, Umbrus is, oh, I remember now. Yes, Umbrus, I, I remember talking about a little bit. But Umbrus is, let's just look at his racial traits. Yes, he is a um, dispater, right? Dispater tiefling? Uh, I gotta go in here and check. Uh, race. Dispater tiefling, yep. Dispater tiefling. Um, he is probably, oh, if I had to guess for this person, a sorcerer or a warlock, but let's see. Yep, he is a... Shadow Sorcerer, I love it, so much shadow. And we should also note about Umbris that he has an aberrant dragon mark. Um, they are all fourth level, I should also mention. So 
I have the Wild Mount book. The Echo Knight is pretty neat, mostly mobility stuff, since you have partially real alternate self that you can switch places with on the field. Very cool. I, I looked at it a little bit when that player and I were talking about him making this character, since the Echo Knight is not from Eberron. Um, and I had a little conversation with the uh, lovely Dan Dillon, who was willing to chat with me about some of my concerns about the class and explain why I'm wrong and why it's not as scary for a DM as it appears that it might be. Um... So, uh, yes. So, anyway, uh, Umbrus has a an aberrant dragon mark. Let's see what he chose. You learn a cantrip and a first level spell from the sorcerer spell list. You can cast it. After you cast a spell with your aberrant mark, you can use one of your hit die and roll it. Dice and roll it. Immediately after you cast a spell, roll the hit die. If you roll an even number, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to the number rolled. If you roll an odd number... One random creature within 30 feet of you, not including you, takes force damage. Holy shit. Equal to the number rolled. If no other creatures are in range, you take the damage. Wow. Okay. So his aberrant dragon mark spells are uh, message and mage armor. Okay. So that is our cast of characters so far. Um, I'm short one player for sure and possibly two players. Um, someone else might be joining the campaign, but we're not sure yet. Dan is a stand-up dude. Yes, he is. Uh, and he is always willing to answer my crazy questions about design and D&D. And he's the best. Um, all righty Roo. So, let me just check something real quick. Any of the players from this campaign are more than welcome to be here, but there will for sure be spoilers. So I'm going to keep an eye on the attendance list in chat. I know that isn't always totally up to date, but just want to know if one of them is going to be here. You know what I mean. Uh, okay, so that's our cast of characters. Um, as I said, they are all members of the Boromar clan, low-level members. Like, maybe they've just joined and done one or two very simple missions uh, oh, I guess maybe more than that, because they are fourth level, but they're still pretty low rank in the in the group. Um, I'm going to see if I can... I'm going to adjust... Oops. I'm going to adjust this little box just a skosh, because... Oh, it's going to do this live. Hold on. I hate that, so I'm going to... Uh, there we go. I just want to adjust that little box, because there's a few other things that I would like to put in as information for you all. So I'm going to just shift that up a hair. There we go. Just checking to make sure it did it. Yes, excellent. All right. Uh, the other things that I want to make note of, I've already forgotten what they are. <laughs> um, oh, I remember. So uh, let's see. Let's just call it, uh, we'll just keep going. Uh, let's say party, oops. This, and I'm running out of room on that, so we're just gonna call this here. Party notes, uh, they all, we rolled on a few things. So Eberron has, uh-oh, there we go. Eberron has some cool things for group patrons, which is how we decided that we're all gonna be, that they're all gonna be members of, um, yo, did you see the German Mary Mercer on Twitch? No, I have Matt Mercer, right? <laughs> Mary Mercer's a hell of an AU. <laughs> um, copycat Matt. Oh. Mary Mercer. Oh, I don't know. I think that might be fun. Um, so, oh, you know why it's not great that I can't, uh, I don't have my headphones on, even though it's way more comfortable? Because I'm not going to hear notifications. Uh, so thank you for the follow, Fluffy. And I don't know why you aren't showing up here on this little recent follower thing, but I'm not going to mess with that right now. So thank you. You the best. Um, all right. Which means... Gonna be pedantic about this. And update it for fun. There we go. All right. Uh, so in... The Rising from the Last War book, there is a whole section of the character creation chapter, chapter one, about having group patrons, uh, which is how we decided to be part of the Boromar clan. 
because uh, there's a crime syndicate group patron and like the the main template that they use is the Boromar clan which is great um, so there's a few things that you can roll on on random tables in here to just learn a little bit about your group and about how they interact with your patron uh, one of the things that we rolled on was the type of uh, crime that they are particularly uh, oh, we didn't do that one because I wanted some doll. Just kidding. Uh, one of the things that we rolled on is uh, a table on why, what makes this group stand out from other groups. As I said, they're still a pretty new group, so they don't stand out a ton. But we did find out that um, everyone in this group, in this little party in the Boromar clan, this cell of the Boromar clan, if you will, they all wear handkerchiefs somewhere on their person uh, at all times and it's like their it's their their insignia um, and of course lots of jokes were made about the color and placement of handkerchief but yeah, we're not gonna go there um, the other thing is that they uh, they have a uh, particular group rival uh, that doesn't like them and we rolled on this and we got rivals with a group of Dask operatives. Um, we'll talk about Dask in a little bit, but Dask is another crime syndicate um, out of Droam. Nope, out of, I always get Droam and the and Dargoon mixed up. Uh, so let me make sure I don't say this wrong because I don't want to, uh, what you call, I don't want to slander anybody who doesn't deserve it. Dask is out of Droam, yes. Monstrous immigrants from Droam, uh, gnolls, harpies, medusas, minotaurs, ogres, trolls, and others, and ultimately under the control of Sorakatra, one of the rulers of Droam. So anyway, they pissed off some of them uh, in Sharn, and so that is... Oh, yay, see, I heard that one. Thanks for the... Oh, I didn't see it. Thanks for the follow. Freaky Skulls, hey, welcome to the party. I appreciate you. We're getting closer. I'm gonna do it. Oh, am I gonna have to recenter this? There are definitely better ways to do this, but mm, this is how I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else we need to know that we have already established about this party? Oh, yes. Lastly, but not leastly, uh, is that they have, and I don't know if you're gonna be able to, thanks. I made an Onomancer today. My DM lets me activate power word kill when I write down the <laughs> that is uh, a very powerful uh, version of the Onomancer. Uh, what level is your Onomancer? I had an Onomancer when I ran a uh, an Avernus campaign that was really, really awesome, uh, played by the incomparable uh, Jeremiah McCoy, Tech Noir, on Twitter. He was awesome. He was a great character. Um, okay, so the last thing is who their contact, who their main... He makes finding names a pain in the ass, though. <laughs> That's probably for the best. Um is who their co their main contact within the syndicate is. And their main contact is a, oh, come on. Ah, a former urchin, now fabulously wealthy, who wants everyone to succeed. So they've got a very, very sweet, oh, you can barely see that. Hold on, I'll fix it. Um, a very, very sweet, uh, kind, nice halfling, or rather urchin, who is their main contact in the syndicate. Prince Aladdin, basically. Yes, actually, although only if Prince Aladdin then turned around and worked for a notorious crime syndicate rather than becoming king of Agrabah, or sultan of Agrabah. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, so that, that's where we are. That's what's happening. That's what we've got. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm a geek. Oh, friend, we are all geeks here. You are 100% fine. I also just realized that you can't see the other side of that. So let's move that over and sort of stretch that out a little bit and see if that helps. Um, no, more? Okay, well, we're going to do as much as we can here. Anyway, you know you got the idea. All right. So, 
we know that we're going to start in the city of Sharn. We're hanging out in the stream about prepping for D&D. We're all geeks here. Yeah, exactly, Fluffy. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the things that I know I want for sure. Um, one of the things that we talked about is because everybody's schedules are kind of wonky right now, and a lot of people have extra free time, but a lot of people actually don't. They're either working just as hard or actually their schedules are more difficult now. Um, this is for my home group. My home group usually has a rule that if two uh, or more of us are unable to make a session, excuse me, then we don't play uh, the primary campaign that day. We like everyone to be there to be a part of the main campaign. And that's generally, excuse me, been the rule because the way that we structure our stories, we try and really write around the characters, and we like everyone to have their little moments, and it's we don't want to leave any characters, um, we don't want to leave any characters out for big stretches of campaign story because that's crappy. Um, and also, we do have we do sometimes play each other's characters when we can't make it to session. We don't want to do that a ton because that gets hard with people trying to juggle multiple characters, possibly making choices that their player that the player's character wouldn't feel like they would make, all of that stuff. Um, I wish I could play a barbarian wood elf with you. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we talked about for this campaign is that we actually would like to do away with that rule and structure the campaign in a way um, that no matter how many people are there, we can do something with these characters and this story. So I think what that's functionally going to mean for us is that... Um, the campaign is super asynchronous and non-chronological, right? We're going to jump around to different uh, to different jobs that the party gets assigned by the Boromar clan, different adventures, different jobs, things like that. Um, and we'll just sort of figure out as we go how those, uh, how those adventures happen chronologically, if that makes sense. That way, if one day we're in the middle of, you know, a particular adventure and three people can't show up and I've only got two or three players, then I can do a small little other adventure with just those players and we'll deal with that then. And then when everyone's back the following week or whenever, you know, enough people are back, we can get back to the other adventure that we were doing. Now, it sounds like a great idea, but... Um, We'll see how difficult it is for me. How Tarantino. <laughs> do we do it online or in real life? I'm in Wisconsin, so I can probably not show up. <laughs> um, we're doing it. So normally this is a group that I have been playing with for about six years now. Um, and we play every week at my apartment here. Um, right now we are all doing the responsible thing and social distancing. So nobody's coming to my apartment. Uh, so we will be moving it things online uh, for our for our group, um, which is one of the reasons that we're starting this new uh, campaign is that the DM who's doing something that we're right sort of about three quarters of the way through right now isn't super comfortable uh, immediately jumping to online play. He's not so experienced in it, and I've done a bunch of stream campaigns and stuff like that. So I said, well, look, take your time figuring it out. I'll hop on and do this. Um, okay, so things we should know. Um, let's see. We'll just sort of put this in some in some basic bullets here. Let's do basic campaign info. Um, and how is that showing up? Where is my Streamlabs? Oh, great. We can move this up a little bit. Oh, not that up. This up and over. Um, as I said, I'm not very good at making overlays, and I am making all this up as I go and creating this overlay as I go. Okay, that's a little better. All right. Um, seriously, though, that approach sounds awesome. Could set up some narrative surprises as you close loops. Well, that, as I was saying it, that's exactly the kind of thing that I realized I want to do. Um, this group loves surprises and intrigue and stuff like that. Uh, most of this group loves surprises and, in and intrigue and stuff like that. Um, and... Yeah. Uh, I did have one player, and this is something that I should have discussed with him in advance, but months after the fact, uh, I ran this group through Out of the Abyss and found out that one player was kind of upset with me about how I took their Warlock patron and the orders that I gave from the Warlock patron about certain things. Um, and whether or not I agree with uh, their take on their patron is completely irrelevant. I should have checked in with that player uh, about some of the things that I was going to have their patron do because they had a very specific uh, view of who their patron was and we weren't on the same page about that. 
and that's my bad. Um, so surprises are good, but I want to be very careful with this group about them. Um, so, right, basic campaign info. Um, we are all members of the Boromar clan. We're doing an asynchronous campaign. Campaign, there we go. Um, and let's say use different non-chronological adventures to create intrigue and mystery. How's that? That sounds like a plan to me. Um, so, so far I've been reading through, I, I will admit, I have not yet gotten all the way through Rising from the Last War. I've been jumping around a bit. I read basically all of chapter one, which is uh, character creation. So it talks about the races of Eberron, um, talks about the dragon marks and their houses, uh, obviously talks about the new class, the Artificer, and then the whole last section of Chapter 1 is about these group patrons. So I went ahead and I read through all the different patrons that are available just to get an idea of what's going on in the world. Um, then I went ahead, so we're going to be in, oh, we should say that the, this campaign is going to begin slash for now be based in Sharn, um, which is in Breland. So that's an important thing to know. Um, my plan right now, I think, is to take the adventure that's published in this book, um, which is called Forgotten Relics, and probably run that as the very first thing that we do. Now, if you know this adventure at all, it's first of all, it's for first through, I believe, second or third level. Um, and second of all, I think some of the antagonists in the story are Boromar, Boromar clan operatives. So obviously there are some things I'm in a need to play. I'm dying slowly on the inside. Oh, freaky skulls. I'm so sorry. This this is my sort of close knit home group. We all live here in the same city and we've been friends for a long time. So um, it's unfortunately just just our group. I'm sorry that I can't invite you to play with us. Um, what was I saying? So, oh, I've completely lost my train of thought. Uh, based in Shark. Oh, this adventure, right? So there's some things that I need to adjust about it. Obviously, I need to adjust the story a little bit so that it's these members of the Boromar clan who are going on the adventure. Um, and then I also need to just basic, just generally adjust the difficulty level because, um, because it's made for first through third level and their fourth level. So those are going to be our big things to start with here. Is it, Filthy says, is it possible to have the antagonists be turncoat operatives? Oh, that's a really interesting idea. I hadn't thought about that. Um, let's talk about, let's, here, let's do this. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, let's say, let's call this Forgotten Relics. Oops, I'm going to be a stickler about this. Forgotten Relics brainstorm. Um, so yeah, that's not a bad idea at all. My original idea, well, idea, whatever, my thought was to have them be, uh, just keep leveling alone, um, would be to just have them, uh, would be to have the antagonists be maybe their Dask uh, rivals, but actually Turncoat Boromar clan operatives isn't a bad idea. So let's say um, antagonist adjustments. That's not how you spell antagonist, because I'm typing fast. Um, okay, so uh, Fluffy's idea is that they are Turncoat Boromar clan, which I like. Another possible would be Dosk operatives, because I think there, but I think there might also be some Dosk operatives. We're going to have a look at that adventure here in a second. Um, other possibilities is it is in Google Docs. I'm going to go ahead and keep it private for right now. Uh, but when we're done today, if we decide that this is something that's useful to the folks who've been here helping, then I will totally make them public for you all. Um, other possible antagonists. I mean, there's a million other, right, espionage agencies and crime syndicates around. Um... And I think maybe we'll find out that there's more to either the Dosk operatives or the Turncoat Bormar clan. Like, who are they ultimately looking for? Maybe it's the Blood of Vol cult, or maybe it's, um, I don't know, some other, the, the, the Cult of the Dragon Below or something like that. But that's for way later. Uh, for right now, let's just stick with they're one of these two things. I like that a lot. 
So uh, I should say now, and I'll try and repeat this as often as possible, there are going to be spoilers in this campaign. First of all, if you are in this uh, stream, first of all, if you are one of my players, massive spoilers. Uh, so watch at your own risk. But also... Um, I'm going to be reading stuff out of, and we're going to be talking about stuff out of Eberron Rising from the Last War. That is going to include the adventure Forgotten Relics. So if you're going to, if you have plans to play in that adventure, um, or if you just generally don't want to be spoiled for it in the future, I so appreciate you being here. This next bit might not be the stream for you, because uh, we are going to talk about this adventure. So let's have a look at what is in, and again, I'm not going to put the adventure up on screen because I don't want to violate uh, Wizards of the Coast's IP, but we will talk a little bit about it. So yeah, this is a short adventure for a party of four to six first level characters who advance, oh, to second level. So we're really going to have to work on, uh, we're really going to have to work. You've been up for an entire day, Skulls. Get some rest. Um, so... We're really going to have to watch the difficulty here as we set it up, but that is no problem at all. We'll just keep an eye on it as we go. All right, so the story overview is that, ah, uh, <laughs> yep, there are definitely Dask operatives, so I think we're going to probably go with uh, the Turncoat Boromars because there is a way to do strike through. There we go. Uh, I think we're going to go with the Turncoat Boromars because the very first sentence of this story overview is Neo Koi, an imposing Oni and Dask subboss in Sharn. Okay, I guess I should have read some of this. Uh, ordered a half orc lieutenant, blah, 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 blah. To assemble a team and search the ruins of old Sharn for arcane relics, like you do. The Artificer is a new class, uh, Skulls, that was released. Uh, the first brand new uh, whole cloth class released since the player's handbook was published back in 2014 in Eberron Rising from the Last War. All right, with a lot of ground to cover beneath the City of Towers, which is Sharn, Gara kidnapped, oh, a scion of the House uh, House Orion, which is one of our dragon-marked houses, and his name is Deorian, which I believe, if I remember correctly, means he is in fact dragon-marked. Forcing Alden to use his position in his Dragonmark house to recruit an out-of-work Warforged, people who no one would wish, to scour old Sharn's ruins looking for his son. Okay. He branded the work as a secret research-gathering mission for his house, played, paid the Warforged workers for silence, and signed them to binding contracts. Okay. Eventually, the Warforged workers found a library and some arcane stuff. They were moved to a Dask safe house in Tavik's Landing, and they planned to smuggle the relics out of Breland to Drome with uh, Alden Dorian, the kidnapped kid's dad, uh, with his help. Cole, a destitute warforged hired by Alden, witnessed her good friend Razor, presumably another warforged, die executed in the ruins of Old Sharn as an example to the other workers. Man, Dask, they're a real treat, aren't they? Uh, Cole made an appointment to talk to Sergeant Germain Vilroy of the Sharn Watch to report the shady operation, Razor's murder, and the kidnapping of the House Orion Scion Caden. Thanks to crooked members of the Sharn Watch in Dusk's pocket, Gara found out, aha, about the appointment and dispatched killers to prevent Cole from ratting out the operation. Okay, so here's where I think we can adjust some things. Rather than involving the Sharn Watch, what if Cole... Instead, knowing that, wow, there are two kids next door, and I ho I think they're playing, but I don't know if you all can hear. They are shrieking at the top of their lungs. It's delightful. Um, oh, and there goes a train by my window. Man, you guys are getting all the noises today. I love it. Um, okay, so instead of Cole, this Warforged, going to the Sharn Watch for help, Maybe Cole, in fact, knows that uh, the Boromar clan is at odds in general with Dusk in Sharn. And so uh, they went to the Boromar clan for help uh, because they know that much of the Sharn watch is um, shady and corrupt and possibly bought. And so, okay, so I love this. Um, and so they went to the Boromar clan instead. But, as Fluffy pointed out, uh, some turncoat Boromar clan operatives were there 
excuse me, um, when the request for a meeting with somebody in the Boromar clan, or maybe even one of them was the one that was supposed to meet with Cole, uh, they found out about it and ratted out Cole to, to Dusk. So, okay, let's make a mark about this. I am sorry that I uh, can't put the text of the adventure up. I know that would probably be easier to follow along with me because I'm reading in bits and pieces. I apologize for that, but like I said uh, twice before, I don't want to violate any IP things. Um, so we're just going to have to do it this way. Okay, so... Um, the beginning of the story, let's say that uh, Cole, Warforged, um, made an appointment with the, and we'll uh, bold the stuff that I'm changing, bold and italicize the stuff I'm changing, with the Borom, oh, well, it's not, oh, it's underlined, not italics, there we go, Boromar clan, um, to report, oops, to, to report uh, Dosk's shady operation. Dosk shady operation. Great. Um, turncoat Boromar oops, operatives. And we should do this. There we go. Turncoat Boromar operatives um, told... Gara, who is the uh, Oni in charge? Nope, not true. Who's Gara? Da, 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 da. Uh, a half ogre lieutenant of Dusk. Okay, half ogre. I never spell this word right. Lieutenant of Dusk. About uh, coal. About coal. Great. Um, and Gara dispatched killers to prevent Cole from talking. Great, fine. Okay, the next part of this, that actually solves a ton of programs. Recommend any program to do my D&D stuff on. Um, I use a lot of just Google Docs, honestly. I know some people use Evernote. Uh, some people use much more complicated sort of note keeping OneNote uh, for Windows users. Um, I just use uh, Google Docs, honestly, and I have a notebook for almost every campaign I run to just write on the fly notes as I'm running so that I can then go back in later to, um, to my Google Drive and add the important stuff as we go. That's what I use. Um, okay, so Turncoat Bormar just told Gara about Cole. Gara dispatched killers to prevent Cole from talking. We're almost through the story overview. Jermaine, who is supposed to be the Sharn Watch sergeant that Cole went to, but now in this case is going to be the Boromar clan operative, who's probably a turncoat, is also crooked, but she's on the payroll of the Boromar clan <laughs> crime syndicate. She is. Okay. Whose members are enemies of Dask. Not wanting to put the Sharn Watch or herself between two criminal organizations at war, Jermaine called in a few old contacts. Oh. To meet with Cole and find out what's going on. Now, see, this is why you read a whole section before you start making notes on things that don't matter. Gotta go soon. Love your prep so far. Oh, thanks for being here, Ish. I'm sorry. I, I know it's been sort of a little scattered and all over the place because I've never uh, streamed or talked out loud during my prep. But thanks for being here. Uh, we'll probably be on for a while if you want to come back a little bit later if you're available. Thanks for stopping in. Fluffy, I have a D&D campaign on D&D Beyond, and there are spots for private DM notes. That way I can keep track of what is player knowledge and what is DM knowledge. That's actually a great suggestion as well because there are those two different text areas. One that can be public to your players. So you can keep stuff in there for them. And one that's just for the DM. No worries. It was great. Thanks, Ish. Have a good day. Okay, so Jermaine, the person on the watch, is also uh, part of the Boromar clan crime syndicate. So maybe actually, I'm. Mean, we did all of this work. I might listen while I drive. Essential stuff, I promise. <laughs> I believe you. Um, so maybe, I mean, I like these ideas that we have, but actually, and I like the work that we did in brainstorming them, but actually maybe we don't need any of it, which, you know, that's campaign planning for you. Um, 
Because if Jermaine is on the payroll of the Boromar clan, then actually we can keep this story exactly as is. And we can, our party can be the ones from the Boromar clan that are sent out to, to do the thing. Okay, so this was all really good. Um, and uh, out it goes. <laughs> That's campaign planning for you, I guess. Um, for right now, because I don't want to totally delete it because it's good stuff. So for right now, I'm just going to strike through. When we run out of space, because I know there's not a ton of space in this overlay for stuff, um, I will delete it or move it around if I have to. Uh, but actually for right now, I just want that so that you all can still see it on your screens. Okay, well, great. So that's the overall summary. So let's recap. Uh, Dask kidnapped a scion of House Orion um, to search the old runes of Sharn for ancient relics. Um, they killed some Warforged. It's a bad situation. Uh, Caden Dorian, who's the scion that was kidnapped, is still kidnapped. Uh, one of the Warforged that was hired for the mission watched a friend of hers die uh, and went to the City Watch to be like, hey, this is going on. No good. Uh, but unfortunately, someone in Dusk found out and is going to try and kill Cole, the Warforged. Fortunately, though, the sergeant of the Watch that Cole was going to is on the payroll of the Boromar clan and might be able to send out our adventurers to help. Okay, so that is the rundown. Something to keep in mind for the future, though. Uh, yes, definitely, because I do like the idea of Turncoat Boromar operatives, and that, for whatever reason, hadn't even occurred to me as a possible antagonist for later on, so we're definitely going to keep that. Okay, then it tells me how to run an adventure. I now have an another adventure summary, question mark? Didn't we just do that? Oh, no, that was the story overview. Excuse me, okay. Okay. Uh, so the adventure begins one evening in the Upper Central Plateau, where they meet Sergeant Germain Vilroy. Um, they are hired to... Okay, so uh, they'll get sent by their contact in the Boromar clan. Whoopsie. That's going to change things, isn't it, when I do that? Yes, it is. Uh, okay, that's all right. Wish I had a little more room. Uh, we're gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and move this down, out of the way, <laughs> and then I'm going. Oh God, damn it! <laughs> You'd think I'd never used a freaking computer before. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, blessings. There we go. Oh, let's come up with a name. That's something you all can help me with, because I am terrible at this. Let's come up with a name for the urch the now fabulously wealthy urchin who is our party's contact within the Boromar clan. Um, so let's actually, we can come up with everything about them, because we don't know anything other than, if we look back at our um, character notes, uh, all we know is that he was an urchin, uh, is that they were an urchin. Maybe it's a woman. Maybe it's maybe they're non-binary. Maybe who knows? Um, so what? Tell me about the urchin. Somebody pop out something about the urchin. It can be what race they are. Uh, it can be their name. Anything like that. What was the job that made them fabulously wealthy? Uh, I will take any of that stuff from you all. Um, which we can put in here. Urchin contact. Can't wait to hear what you all come up with. In the meantime, let's talk a little bit more about what this adventure is. So, uh, they the characters meet with Sergeant Vilroy, um, and Sergeant Vilroy tells them to meet with Cole. Uh, they He wants them to hear her out and then bring her back to Vilroy for further questioning. Uh, they're to meet Cole at the Cog Carnival, a warforged bar in the High Walls district of Lower Tavix Landing. <laughs> That's maybe the most confusing area of Sharn in terms of nomenclature, because it's in Lower Tavix Landing, but it's called High Walls. Anyway. Um, Genderbent Doc Holiday archetype. Oh, that's sort of fun. Okay. All right. Okay. 
Doc Holiday type. Um, I think she's a gambler, sure. Great, so she just made a ton of money at gambling, is that the idea? Kind of like that. Uh, after talking to Cole and learning her employer was Alden Dorian. All right. Okay. So the characters talk to Cole, find out that she worked for, uh, the head of House Dorian, House Orion. Um, they're confronted by some Dosk forces that were sent to k kill Cole. So I'm sure we have a little combat in there. If they survive the fight. Whoa. It's first level. Yeah. I guess that's why they have to say that. Characters can meet with Alden in the Mithril Tower. Uh, district of Upper Central Plateau. That's where House Orion is located. The Scion, which is Alden, stays tight-lipped, but his Kalishtar bodyguard telepathically gives the characters directions to the old Sharn ruin where the son, Caden Dorian, is imprisoned. Okay. If Caden is rescued and returned to his father, okay, so I guess they gotta go down to old Sharn. This is very cool. So far, we've been in three different districts, which I love. Alden shares what he knows of Dask's operation and tells the characters where to find Gara. Okay, we're back to Gara, who's the lieutenant of this or of this uh, operation. The half ogre knows the characters are coming for her, though. She tries to flee on a lightning rail while drawing them into a trap. If the characters chase down the half ogre, she attempts to make a deal to keep her freedom, which they can either refuse or accept, setting the stage for further adventures. Okay, cool. I love this. So, since we don't actually have to adjust uh, the party, uh, sorry, the story at all for this Boromar clan operative party, um, then I think the main thing that we want to we wanna do is just sort of check out the balance of this adventure, since we've got fourth level characters participating in it uh, rather than first and second. Um, how does that sound to everybody? So we'll just sort of go through, have a look at this adventure, see what see where we might want to um make some adjustments okay the next section of the adventure is how do you know vilroy well we already know that we don't really know vilroy but we're being sent by the boromar clan so that's fine starting the adventure okay we explain to them where they are um, it looks like they start in somewhere in Sharn, blah, 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 blah. Have the players introduce themselves if they aren't already acquainted. They are. This is a good time for characters to make personal connections and might link them. Okay. Um, Sergeant Germaine Vilroy, neutral female brellish human veteran, greets the characters and then gets down to business. Okay, I don't think we have to adjust Sergeant Vilroy at all. She is... Uh, she is a veteran, so if they decide to fight her, her challenge rating is already three, but gods, I hope they don't do that. We just need to talk to her, so that's great. Then we go to High Walls in Lower Tavik's Landing to meet uh, the Warforged named Cole. Um, do, 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 do. Anybody know Cole? So we gotta meet Cole, we gotta chat with Cole. Okay, then... She tells the party, uh, once you calm her down and, and, you know, explain that you're there, Urchin made initial money running card scams, three-card Monty, etc., then took that money and became legit through playing in non-cheating card games rather than dealing in scams, but is being extorted by a crime boss. Oh. So this Urchin doesn't even really want to be part of the Boromar clan. Interesting. Gambler extorted by Boromars or work she, uh, she cheated at three dragon ante against some boromar people i like that all right all right all right i see it um doo -doo 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 -doo. let's put you over there so i can see what is going on excellent okay um so, once Cole explains about the kidnapping and the murder of her friend and Dosk's hunt for artifacts and blah, 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 a bolt of fire explodes inches from Cole's head, causing bedlam in the Cog Carnival. Cole runs for her life, shouting that the party set her up. The chase is on. I love these books, man. Okay. 
I like that idea, especially because it gives the party an option to go legitimate if they don't wish to be under the thumb of the clan. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. At least one, if not two, of these players um, don't love the idea of uh, working for a crime syndicate. I mean, they're they're cool with the idea of the of the adventure, but they made it very clear to me that they're not evil characters um, and they have their own reasons for supporting a crime syndicate. So yes, Fluffy, that's a great point um, for the story that uh, that Carl told us about the urchin getting extorted by the Bormar clan. I like that a lot. Um, okay, so Cole is running. Uh, she sprints 60 feet away from the characters into the streets of Highwall, intent on escape. She has no particular destination in mind. She just wants to get away. Chase takes place in theater of the mind. Everything in this campaign is probably going to take place in theater of the mind. Okay, if Cole runs away and the characters pursue her, you can use the chase rules and urban chase complications table in chapter eight of the Dungeon Master's Guide to resolve the scene. I to resolve the scene. I do love a good chase. Um, the chase ends when the characters catch up to Cole, or after three rounds, when a Das hit squad intercepts Cole as she runs through an alley. Okay, so here's something we can do then uh, as we plan this that I'll enjoy. How do you all feel about um, making some adjustments among all of us to the urban chase complications table? Because uh, a lot of that stuff is pretty generic. And particularly if you are versed in Eberron uh, and Sharn in particular, I would love some ideas for things to replace in this uh in this urban chase complication chart. So if you're not familiar, uh, while while uh, <laughs> while the stream is catching up to my real life, what I'm talking about, um, I will just tell you that the urban chase that the chase table, uh, chase rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide um, allows for each character basically at the end of their turn rolls a d20. If they get a 10 or less, the next player in the initiative order uh, has some complication that tries to interrupt their chasing of their quarry. Um, and it's things like, uh, the ground beneath your feet is slippery with rain, spilled oil, or some other liquid. Make a DC 10 dexterity saving through. On a failed save, you fall prone. Uh, so that's if you roll a 5 on your d20. Things like that. Uh, but I would love, so there's 10 things. I would love to find some Eberron-specific things, if you all have ideas that we could uh, put into this chase table. Um, for example, one of them that's really easy, and I'll get us started here. Uh, let's move this down just a little bit, and whoops, and we can do this. So this is, you know what, I'm gonna, can we make these headings a little smaller so they take up this room? Yeah, I like that better. There we go. Look how much better that is. Um, all right, so let's do this. Oops, where's my chat? There's my chat you over here for a sec okay so here we've got no 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 i want heading three because it's cold uh eberron uh, let's say sharn chase complications great we're gonna number them okay so the first one on the regular list of just generic urban chase complications is a large obstacle such as a horse or cart blocks your way make an acrobatics check to get past the obstacle if you fail it's difficult terrain fine that's cool, but we're in Sharn, uh, and we're now we're in lower. We are in lower um, Tavis Landing, right? Um, so we don't have to worry, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you feel about this. Um, we don't really have to worry about uh, running around on bridges and falling off of bridges in this, you know, several miles high city. Uh, that will come later in the adventure when we're doing the lightning rail stuff and things like that. Um, but for right now, let's just flavor some of these things a little bit more in the Eberron style. So instead of generically a horse or a cart, why don't we say that um, a, oh, something, something very eberron -y. I'm trying to think it's not obviously it's not a lightning rail cart because I don't think that's going to be in lower Tavis landing um but maybe it's a um I don't know toss out ideas instead of a horse or a cart what's a particularly eberron uh thing that might get in the pursuer's way um number two is so let's see something Clawfoot dinosaur. Oh, that's exactly it. Yes. 
a Talenta Plains Halfling Barbarian and their Clawfoot Dinosaur Mount. I love that. That's what gets in the way. Um, and we'll say that uh, they can, in addition to acrobatics, uh, character can roll animal handling to get through. I like that. Uh, I love that. Great. Thank you, Carl. That was a great suggestion. All right, so the second one is a crowd blocks your way. That's fine. That can be what it is. No change. Um, the third one, a large stained glass window or similar barrier blocks your path. Make a strength saving throw to smash through the barrier and keep going. On a fail save, you bounce off the barrier and fall prone. That's very funny. Uh, I definitely want to keep that idea. Is there anything in particular about the stained glass window or similar barrier that might be particularly eberron in nature. I don't know. I like that one so much. I think no change for that one, too. Unless someone has a brilliant idea, feel free to pop it in chat. All right, number four. Um, let's see. Number four. A maze of barrels, crates, or similar obstacles stand in your way. You can make your acrobatics check or an intelligence check of your choice to navigate the maze of obstacles. Okay, well, rather than... Uh, barrels, crates, or similar obstacles. Can we be more specific about what those things are? Maybe it is, gosh. Um, okay, I will accept suggestions for this one too. See, this is where my inexperience with Eberron comes into play. I like the idea of a warehouse. Um, Artificer contraptions, love that. Fluffy is the warehouse idea for uh, number three, which is the stained glass window because that could be fun. So uh, Chase goes through a warehouse uh, 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 either. I kind of like this one because it also, okay, so Chase goes through a um, stained glass warehouse because then it's like, holy crap, uh, they have to, oh, an industrial style warehouse would be a good maze. Uh, but I think I'm going to go with uh, Carl's idea of artificer contraptions for the maze and do a stained glass warehouse so they really have to duck and weave and dodge, um, which sounds very funny and ultimately is going to sort of end up being the same thing as the maze. Um, but anyway. Uh, okay, then number four is artificer contraptions. And we'll say... Uh, in addition to acrobatics or intelligence checks, um, on a failed check, the maze counts as 10 feet of difficult terrain. And let's say failed check also gives, um, is it damage or is it a condition? One of the artificer contraptions does something to the character. Mm. Well, there's so many of these that fall prone. I was going to say it's like a grease spill, but we've already got an oil spill later. Maybe this one is... Um, oh, uh, how about this? It's basically like um, blinded for a minute. Oh, I like that. Uh, let's be a little... <laughs> a minute might be the entire length of this chase. So let's say fail check also gives blindness for, let's say, one round, uh, since the chase is a maximum of three rounds anyway. Um, I like that. Um, great. It's like a flashbulb situation. Yes, I love that. Flashbulb. That says built bulb. There we go. Bolt. Not a word. Anyway, okay, I love this. This is great. Okay, number five says, the ground beneath your feet is slippery with rain, spilled oil, or some other liquid. I think that's fine. Unless someone has a great idea there, we can just leave that as it is. Number six says, you come upon, ah, you come upon a pack of dogs fighting over food. Make an acrobatics check to get through unimpeded. On a fail check, you're bitten and take 1d4 piercing damage and the dogs count as five feet of difficult terrain. We can do better than dogs. Now, we've already done a dino mount, so maybe this is... Um, oh, how about... Uh, I just read... Uh, I was just reading when I was reading about... Um, what you call it? About Sharn. Uh, I saw that there's a game that shifters play called don't remember. I will tell you in a moment. Um, dur, 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 dur. Guide to the city. I think it's in here. Um, Tavix Landing. Nope. 
Oh, I should definitely be reading this section. Well, we'll do that in a minute. Um, Guide to the City. I thought it was... Maybe it's in the previous chapter. Nope. It's called, like, Hazar something. I don't know. I know that it failed the investigation check. Why can't I remember what... Okay, maybe it's in chapter two, then, in the section on Breland. Um, interesting things about Breland. New sire wrote, Aftermath of the Last War. Nope, not in there. Yes! Hrozhak, thank you. You are brilliant, Fluffy. Ten points to you. Hrozhak. Fantastic. Sports and games. So, so basically, this game is a game that... Uh, shifters play where they try and capture the other team's uh, wooden statuette and bring it along with theirs to their goal. So you have to have both of them. Uh, but it's played sometimes, uh, there are formal uh, Hrazhak arenas, uh, but sometimes they create temporary fields in slums and warehouses uh, from time to time, and shifter youths often play impromptu games in the park. So let's say uh, for this, that what number is this number six so you come upon uh a a uh, group of young shifters fighting over a hrazhawk statue um and we'll call the damage damage is bludgeoning if they can't uh if they don't manage to uh get through the pack of or the group of shifters unimpeded all right, all right, I like that, I like that. All right, number seven, you run into a brawl in progress. I think that one's fine. It can be, we can flavor it with like, you know, um, some people are fighting with some refugees from New Sire. Um, okay, so no change there. A beggar blocks your way. Make it uh, to slip past the beggar. You succeed automatically if you talk to... Eh, that's fine. Okay, there are definitely beggars in Lower Tavis Landing, so no change there. That one's fine. Number nine, an overzealous guard mistakes you for someone else. If you move 20 or more feet on your turn, the guard makes an opportunity attack against you with a spear. Interesting. I could see leaving that one as is, but maybe instead of a guard, it's a... It's another Warforged, maybe? Warforged in place, oops, in place of guard. Guard. <laughs> okay, and the last complication, you're forced to make a sharp turn to avoid colliding with something impassable. Make a dexterity saving throw to navigate the turn. On a fail save, you collide with something hard and take 1d4 bludgeoning damage. I'm actually gonna leave that one as it is and have my players tell me what the hard thing is that they, <laughs> oh boy, at the risk of getting all kinds of inappropriate answers, what the hard thing is that they collide with. Um, cool. I love this. All right. So that's our new chase complications table. I think it looks great. I'm very excited about it. Uh, that's what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Great. Thinking about it, thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, the next thing I think I would like to do, actually, because it looks like it's a pretty sh relatively short section, um, is read a little bit about Tavik's Landing, since that's where the first part of this um, adventure takes place. And I don't know anything about Tavik's Landing. Don't know about you all, but I don't. So we're going to read a little bit about Tavik's Landing. Um, thank you for your help with that. That was great, and I'm very excited about... Uh, about this chase. Okay. So Tavix Landing. Everyone who comes to Sharn passes through Tavix Landing. The quarter took on uh, a martial aspect during the last war, and the tense atmosphere can still be felt today. On the positive side, Watch Commander Iyana Ir Talan, and the Ir prefix for last names means that they're of a noble house. Uh, but not a dragon-marked house, has gone to great efforts to purge corruption from the local garrisons of the Sharn Watch. Clearly she didn't do a good enough job. As a result, this is one of the few districts where the Watch is both helpful and competent. I mean, yes. On the downside, visitors from any nation that fought against Brelin during the war might be greeted with suspicion or hostility. Okay, fair enough. 
Tavik's Landing, noteworthy locations. Um, I'm going to ignore all the stuff that's not in Lower Tavik's Landing for right now, because we are decidedly in Lower Tavik's Landing for this part. So the three things that are in Lower Tavik's Landing, one of them is in the Dragon Eyes District, and it's called Chance, a legendary gambling hall. In addition to standard games, it's said that the host can cover a wide range of unusual waivers. Well, that wagers. Well, that could mean a million things. Okay. Uh, in Lower Landing, there's also the Terminus Station, an enclave of House Orion. Uh, this site contains the Lightning Rail Station. Oh, there is a Lightning Rail Station. Hmm. We might have to change one of our uh, one of our chase complications to be a lightning rail car gets in the way. Uh, that's cool. We'll think about that in a moment. Um, the administrators coordinate the many Orion ca caravans that come and go from Sharn. Many of the other dragon-marked houses have small outposts in or around Terminus Station, allowing travelers to immediately access the services of House Civis, uh, who are the, oh, this is good practice for me, House Civis, which are the mess, those are the gnome, uh, the gnomish house that deals with uh, messengers and communications. Uh, so you can get them to, like, cast sending or send letters or things like that. House Deneath. Ah, crap, which one's House Deneath? Is that... Oh, man, I should remember this. I just went through all these. Let's have a look, because that's what this planning session is about, learning and remembering more about Eberron. So let's see. House Deneath might be the mark of... Not of Passage. Not of Making. That's um, Kenneth. Of Sentinel? Yes, Mark of Sentinel, so bodyguards and such. Very cool. Okay, got it. Um, and others. Fine. Okay, so Terminus Station is down here, so we might think about using that. Uh, finally, also in Dragon Eyes, just like Chance, is Velvets. Staffed by Changelings, this comfortable inn specializes, oops, in fulfilling fantasies. Okay, both the staff and the rooms can be adapted to fit any scenario. Though some clients have romance in mind, others come to Velvets to relive triumphs, prepare for debates or trials, or for help in developing a new identity. Actually, I really love that. How cool. Um, all right. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's continue on and read a little bit about Lower Tavix Landing in particular. Two land routes to Sharn, land routes to Sharn, both end at Lower Tavix Landing. The let me get this a little bit closer. There we go. The Orion Lightning Rail deposits passengers in the district of Terminus, right? While those who travel to Sharn on the old road arrive at Roan's Gate. Getting to the better parts of Sharn from here means passing through the Black Arch, a heavily fortified garrison district designed to repel enemies and withstand a full siege, which Sharn never experienced during the last war, but that's okay. The ward offers a variety of services catering to travelers. Dragon Eyes District is a maze of taverns, inns, brothels, and gambling halls. It's also noteworthy for being the site of one of the few changeling communities in Breland. Very cool. House Orion has a strong presence in Lower Tavik's Landing, which we talked about. Um, house Lyrandar, who are the um, Skyship's house. Um, they are the mark of... Wait, I'm going to remember this. Mark of Storm, right? That's House Lyrandar? Yeah. Um, they're the ones who create the airships. So, House... Uh, oh, I lost my place. Uh, house Lyrandar and House Deneath are also well represented, with their representatives arranging matters of trade, transport, and security. These days, Lower Tavik's Landing is best known for High Walls, uh, which is, I believe, where um, the Cog Carnival is. A former residential district converted into a home, oh, for refugees from the last war. I did not make that connection. High Walls is filled past capacity mostly by Sirens, or Sirens, uh, who were displaced by the morning, which was the end of the, the big calamity at the end of the last war. The gates are open at present, but High Walls is designed to serve as a fortress prison if the need arises, and the Sharn Watch, excuse me, the Sharn Watch keeps an eye out for any signs of unrest. Oh, okay, that's good to keep in mind. This is not New Sire, but there are a lot of refugees, I guess. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. So things to do in Tavix Landing, you can take a chance. We've talked about that. There's lots of gambling halls. You can find refuge for the uh, Sirens or Sirens. Bond over blood. The Greystone District in Middle Tavix Landing. Whoop, don't care. <laughs> okay. 
We've learned a little bit about Lower Tavik's Landing. I like it. I like it. I do want to briefly revisit our discussion about uh, the chase complications because I think it might be fun to involve, uh, to sort of foreshadow. Uh, I guess they're not going to Terminus, though. They're not getting as far as Terminus. All right, we're going to leave it the way it is. Trust your gut, Yuge. Okay. Let's get back to the adventure, if I can find the tab in which I have the adventure. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Are we enjoying this? Is there something you would like me to do more of, less of, things you want me to talk more about? Um, I know it's a bit tedious because I'm just going through this and I am, like I said, learning how to do a streamed prep session. But if you all are enjoying, then we are good. This is fun. Oh, good. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Fluffy. Um, okay. Starting the adventure. Blah, blah, blah. High walls. Cog carnival. Blah, 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 blah. Reminds me of the old times of doing this with Pat from the Dungeon Rats. Oh, yeah. I do remember doing this with Pat every now and again. Man, I miss that dude. He's up in, in Rhode Island, and he and I chat occasionally, but only very briefly and occasionally. Miss that dude. All right. Uh, chatting with Cole. Dask hit squad. Uh, oh, wait. This is it. Okay. So, Cole runs away. We do the chase. Um, they either... Catch coal, or uh, they don't. <laughs> but after three rounds, if they don't catch coal, uh, the Dask hit squad intercepts her as she runs through an alley. All right, so if they fail to catch up to coal before the Dask hit squad attacks, the characters hear the Warforged scream for help in a nearby alley. I really hope my players go after her because there is a very good chance that they won't. <laughs> Anyway, if the characters rush to help her, they find the Warforged unconscious, holy shit, on the ground, but stable, surrounded by Dask criminals. Well, I mean, criminal is a matter of perspective, but anyway. Uh, if the characters resolve this chase by catching up to Cole, the Dask criminals attack as soon as the chase ends, and the Warforged aids the characters in battle. Oh, interesting. All right, so good. That's good for story, right? Because we're going to run into this hit squad from Dusk either way, which is going to be important, I think. Okay, this is... So now we've got a combat, so we want to... We're going to work on balance here, because this is balanced for uh, four to six first-level characters, and I'm going to have five fourth-level characters. So, the Dusk force consists of Hound, a chaotic evil, evil female shifter... Uh, and we've got the shifter stat block here, but we're going to want to give her a little bit more because that's only CR one half. Leading three cranky kobolds. Love that. Love me some kobolds. If you listen to The Last Refuge, my podcast, you know I love me some kobolds, although I like them to be good kobolds. Uh, and one kobold acolyte. Each Das criminal fights until reduced to half its hit points and then flees. Interesting. If the characters capture one of the criminals, a successful charisma intimidation check compels the captive to reveal the following information. Okay. The criminals have no other useful information to share with characters other than the two points listed. They don't know that Gar is a half-ogre. They don't know how to contact her. Um, you can may have your characters make a history check to know Dask's members are mostly immigrants from Drome. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Great. So... Uh, let's talk about this combat. So right now we have, uh, let me put this here. I'm just going to keep moving it like this. And okay. So this is Dusk, Dusk hit squad combat. Okay. So right now exist, oh, existing combatants. We have a... No, that's not what I want. Oh, I don't like it when it does that. Right, but I but I don't want that. Thanks. I would I give up. Doesn't matter that much. Um Okay, so the existing companions are a shifter, which is CR one half. Uh three kobolds, which are CR one eighth, I believe. I should actually double check that before I write it down. Yes, one eighth. And please don't ask why I know that off the top of my head. It doesn't matter. Um, and one cobalt acolyte, which is CR a quarter? Maybe? Let's find out. Yes, one quarter. Okay. And they fight till one half HP. Oh, sorry. Oh, I bet that sounded terrible. I apologize. Um, okay. So... I think we should keep 
the fact that we've got a uh, shifter and four kobolds because I think that's a great like flavor thing for um, for Sharn, particularly the shifter. But also the kobolds because there's that whole kobold community down sort of um, underneath the city of Sharn. Um, okay, sorry, I'm getting texts from members of this campaign, so I just want to make sure that it is not, in fact, about um, this game <laughs> or my stream. Okay, great. Also, this really needs to be here in front of me so that when I get texts in the future, I can see them so that I don't freak out like I just did. It's all fine. We are all fine. Okay, um, so my advice... Fluffy says, would be to pluck some abilities from their stat blocks and apply them to some of the NPC stat blocks, such as veteran or spy or something. That is a great idea, and sort of where I was going to go with this, right, would be to take their racial abilities and just sort of pump things up a little bit. I love that idea. Okay, so let's have a look at, let's have a look at this shifter stat block. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to put it up on screen because this is specifically from Rising from the Last War. If it were something from the basic rules, I would totally put it up for you all to see with me. But um, I'm just going to talk about it. I don't. I don't want to have the image up on the screen. So the shifter stat block, as like the monster stat block, right? Uh, that you would use for this. Um, they have an ability for shifting, uh, which will definitely apply, right? But then other than that, they just have their short sword melee weapon attack plus five to hit. Um, plus three damage, and their bite, which is the same thing but a smaller damage die, right? Okay, so let's look at, I mean, let's have a look at the spy stat block. I like that idea, at least as somewhere to start, um, to add to this shifter's abilities. Now, a spy CR1, which is great because we've got multiple things here, and we can definitely have... Uh, some of the other ones be a little higher power. Um, you know what I want to look at? Is there... I can't remember. Is there a version of the spy that's, like, maybe from Xanathar's, maybe? That's a little bit higher... Uh, a little bit higher CR than CR1. Let's have a look. Let's organize these by CR. Um, you know what? I can, actually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to create a new overlay, but I can show you, I don't mind showing you uh, the list of monsters on D&D Beyond. So give me one second, and I'm going to create a new little scene. D&D. Uh, &D. Um, okay, so we're going to do a window capture. Nope, too many. There we go. We're going to capture, where is it? I think it's this one. Yes, yes it is. Um, all right, thank you all for bearing with me. Let's shrink this down a little bit. Okay. Okay, and then I'm just going to add my camera, because I, for whatever reason, assume you all want to see my face during this. Heaven knows why. Um... Okay, and then I would, oops, and then I would love to add, eh, that's fine for now. Let's just go ahead and shift this over. Okay, um, oh, that's the other thing I wanted to do. I prefer my transitions to be fades rather than, yes, that's so much nicer. Okay, all right, so here is our monster list. Now, we definitely want something that's higher CR than zero. Goodness. FYI, the D&D Beyond Encounter Builder has this encounter as deadly for four level one characters for balance ideas. Thank you. Good to know. I assume they were able to do that because, A, I don't think you're meant to, I don't think you'll probably have any other encounters this day. And also because they only fight till half their hit points are gone and then they run, which I assume is uh, taking down the difficulty a hair. But that's great to do for comparison uh, values. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate you. Okay, so we're still at CR1. NPC is the tag I want. Let's add that to our search parameters. Where is monster tags? NPC. 
Great, let's filter that. And let's do this. All right, here we go. Oh, and you know what? We could even do starting at CR1 and going up to four, but not any higher than that. Okay, why do you never put it in order? Okay, here we go. All right, so we got the spy, that's great. Uh, I don't think we want a bard, hilarious though that would be. That's for later. Cult fanatic. Now that might be something that we want to use for um, instead of the acolyte stat block. So I'm just going to make a quick note in that other document. Uh, cult fanatic. Fanatic. Okay, that's a possibility for that. We'll come back to that later. Um, druid, no. Fathomer, no. Um, let's see, what do we got, what do we got? If you all see anything, call out. I know I'm sort of going through quickly. These are all named individuals, which is not really what I'm looking for. Okay, priest is also an option instead of cult fanatic for that acolyte. Slightly higher CR. What else do we have? Thayan warrior, I guess we could do that. Archer, mm, no. I think we want to keep this one in melee for now. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, we're running up towards the end. I thought there was something else, but maybe it's... Oh, we could do knight. Let's have a look at the knight stat block. What? Uh, what is this from? Oh, basic rules. Great. So I can put this on screen and I don't mind. Um, knight. Here we go. All right, so this would give a leadership thing to them, which is sort of interesting. Also has a parry. All right, that's a possibility. So we could do spy, which is CR1, or we could do knight, which is CR3. Okay, we'll think about this. We'll come back to it. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, here's the veteran, which you also mentioned. Uh, that basically, it looks like the only, this is also basic rules, I hope, yes. Uh, it looks like the only difference here is that they get multi-attack, which I do kind of like. So we could just do, we could just say veteran, which is CR3, and also really is just multi-attack. Um, plus this short sword bonus, whatever. Um, all right, let's look at the last page. I don't think we want anything CR4, but... I don't know if there is anything CR4. Oh, we haven't fight the Pudding King. No, that looks like it, because we're not in a Warlock of the Archway. Okay. Um, those are great for our current... Uh, oops. For our current little listy-poo of options. Um, we've got some ideas for the Cobalt Acolyte. Um, and then we have these three Cobalts that... Frankly, if we did either a knight or a veteran for the shifter, we could do the kobolds as spies, right? And make them CR1. So let's just have a look. I'm going to I'm going to bring you all over to the encounter builder and let's just see what that looks like. Excuse me, if we do some of this together. Um let's bring you back over to this scene. Um okay, so in theory, we're going to do, let's say, let's just call it a knight. It's just going to calculate the CR, so it doesn't really matter. But um, also, I have not put in the proper party information yet, so this is calculation's not going to be accurate quite yet. Um, okay, the spy, we said we were going to do three of them. And then let's call it the priest. I think I like that idea better. Okay, now let's manage our characters. I'm going to have five level four characters. Okay, this is deadly, so we like that. Now, how how deadly is it? Let's find out. Might be a little tough. Might be a, a little bit tough. Um... Yeah, that might be a little bit difficult for them. So, um, there's some different ways. We could scale down. Now, let's see. The shifter, as they were, was CR 1 half. Let's just see what happens if I replace this with a regular shifter. 
Now it's only hard difficulty, so it's not exactly... Oh, you all are seeing something very weird, aren't you? I'm so sorry, I did not realize that you were not getting the part of the screen that actually shows... Oopsie. That actually shows you the calculation that I'm talking about. Right, give me one second and I will pull that up. Here we go. There you go, now you can see it. Um, all right, so this is what it looks like if we keep the shifter, which was the highest CR monster of the originals. Um, we're only at hard difficulty, but I'll show you what it looked like when we had the knight in. Um, suddenly it becomes super deadly, right? And what I was talking about before was I reduced the number of spies that we had and it stayed deadly all the way until I completely got rid of one of them, right? So, all right. Um, I definitely don't mind challenging this party. I think they're good for it, and they're they're pretty they're experienced players that can probably take it. And we also have to remember that these folks only fight until half of their hit points are gone, which is such a small number. Look, twenty seven hit points means they only have to hit thirteen hit points per spy. Let's have a look at the priest. Oh, that's not what I meant to do, but it's fine. It works. Again, 13 hit points on the priest. And let's have a look at the spy. 13 hit points on the spy. So they only actually have to do... Let's see. We've got... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 13 is 50. 65. They only have to do 65 points of damage to these guys to get them all to run. So this is a pretty deadly encounter. But I actually think maybe this is the way that we want to go. I do want to have a look at the knight real quick. I am more interested in the knight having this sort of interesting thing than being able to do three attacks, because I just think this is more fun, this, this leadership thing. So I think we're going to do the knight instead of the veteran. Let's have a look at the priest. got some pretty gnarly spell casting. Um, third level is a lot, uh, particularly if he were to try and use some of his like guiding bolts, say, at a higher level. So I'll just have to be aware of that, knowing that this is an extremely difficult encounter in terms of, you know, XP, not in terms of hit points, obviously. Um, I'll just have to be aware of that. Maybe not maybe not use a third level guiding bolts against my players, but that's okay. I like this as a priest because if we look at the acolyte stat block, it's basically, right, it's basically the same thing, but only with first level spells. Um, okay, I feel good about this. And then the spy has got, yeah, absolutely. The spy's got two melee attacks. They can do sneak attack. They got cunning action. I love this. I think this is great. Um, Okay, so let's go back then to, nope, wrong one for me. Let's go back to this document um, and make some final decisions here. All right, so we're going to go with knight. Uh, but we also want to be sure that we remember, as Fluffy pointed out, that we are still definitely using the shifter abilities, right? So they're able to... Sorry, that's a super loud train coming by my apartment. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, okay, so where was I? Where is... I've lost my... Right. Um, okay, so we want to... Ugh. There we go. We want to use the knight, but we also want to give them shifting. Shifting. There we go which is bonus action, one minute, five temp HP, bite as bonus. Okay, that's that. Great, love that. Now let's have a look at the spell kobolds and see if there's anything that we need to add to the spy or the acolyte. I believe that there is. If I remember correct, they have a... Oh, they don't. I was incorrect. I thought, because I know the PC version of the kobolds have that, like, cower 
mechanic, but the basic kobolds do not. Okay, that's fine. What they do have, though, just gonna make this nasty, is pack tactics. It's gonna make that spy's sneak attack very effective. Um, I'm not, well, I guess, okay, so we're going with priest. Oops, why isn't that working? There we go. We're going with priest, which is CR, oops, CR2, and, oh, why am I doing that? Pack tactics. Okay, I don't know why. I did, oh, no. Uh, 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 uh. There we go. <laughs> Organization, yo, it's important. Um, okay, I like the way that this looks. So it's uh, a shifter who has the stats of a knight, so they're going to be tough. A spy and a uh, three spies and a priest. To make encounter slightly less deadly, maybe drop the knight's AC by one to two points. It's tough to hit. You are right. I uh, I only looked at HP. I did not look at armor class. Is it an eighteen? Yeah. Yes, I think you are correct. Let's have a look at the shifter and see what the shifter is normally wearing on their own. Okay, so the shifter is normally wearing leather armor. Veteran may be better suited than knight. Yeah, let, let me have a look at the veterans. The reason I liked knight was because I like the idea of the um, battlefield leadership ability. But it that might be too much. I might be, I might be gilding the lily, as they say. The veterans got splint and a t holy crap. Wait, how many hit points does the knight have? Oh, the knight has fifty two hit points. Okay, that's fine. Um. The veteran has split mail, so it's still AC 17. So I think here's what we're going to do. Yeah, they've got about the same number of hit points. Um, okay, here's what I think we're going to do. Um, we are, so the shifter normally is wearing leather armor. Let's give the shifter studded leather, um, which then, oh, I just had an idea. What if, okay, tell me how we feel about this. So we have two options. Um, one, we can keep the knight or the veteran. We can have a conversation about that. Give them studded leather. So their AC would be 15. Um, 15 or 14? No, I think 15. Um, come on. Yeah, it would be 15. Um, and we can keep it at that. And if we use Knight, we have that battlefield leadership. Uh, if we use the Veteran, they get a ton of attacks. Or, what if we used the... Hey! Hello, how you doing? Uh, is this... Which of you is this? I never know which of you, uh, from how we roll, is is behind your Twitch. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Joe? Ian? Ian? Ian! Hi, Ian! Uh, <laughs> how you doing? Um, what was I saying? Oh, or we could, and I think this is basic rules. Yes, so I'll bring it up on the screen. Um, we could go bandit captain. Oops, my face is in the way. Um, move this back over. There we go. We could go bandit captain. Video game nerd one. Joe is the book one. <laughs> I'll remember that. I love that. Um, we could go Bandit Captain. Now, on the one hand, he's actually got more hit... He's lower CR. He's actually got more hit points than the Veteran or the Knight. Um, AC is already there. Doesn't particularly have an interesting action like the Knight does. Does have the parry reaction, so that's okay. I don't know. How do we all feel? Knight, Veteran... Uh, knight or Veteran, both with lowered AC... Or Bandit Captain. Thoughts and feelings about this one? Because I'm, to be honest, I'm torn. Let's have a look one more time at the um, Knight stat block. And let me just see what that ability actually is. Leadership. Oh, we can only do it once per combat. Whenever a non-hostile creature within 30 feet makes an attack roll or a saving throw, a creature can add a d4 to the roll, provided it can hear or understand... 
that is not as exciting as I thought. And we've also just done a bunch of exciting stuff, right? We just went on a chase. That was fun and different. Maybe, maybe a straight up, maybe a straight up combat with the veteran is the way to go. I'm going to proceed that way, but I know there's a slight delay. So if by the time you all are hearing this, you have other thoughts, let me know. But I do think that's how I'm for right now going to proceed. Okay, so this is actually veteran. Uh, we want, whoopsie, studded leather armor. So AC is 15. And then they have their shifting bonus. I think that feels like a difficult, you like bandit captain for the reaction. Yeah, you're right. Makes combat interesting. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Bandit, oh, whoops. Bandit captain. You're absolutely right. That was what was sort of bothering the back of my brain. Uh, it makes things more interesting. You're absolutely right. Okay, so I like this. And also, this is going to make, did I close that? No, here it is. So let's go back and have a look at the encounter builder, which of course I'm going to have to move back over. There we go. Let's go back and look at this encounter builder. And instead of the knight, we're going to put the bandit captain. And that is deadly, but not horribly so, right? Because we drop two of the... Okay, you're right. This is absolutely better. This is absolutely what we want. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Hey, that was fun. Works for me. Low AC plus high HP makes for more satisfying combat. Agree there. Uh, ooh, for flavor, totally have the shifter use their bite as the parry. Imagine seeing someone catch your sword with your teeth. Oh, that's so good. Yes, that is exactly what we're doing. I love that. Uh, that goes here. Um, okay, we can take that out because that's already the AC, but parry with shifted teeth. Okay, so in fact, I would like for this to come up here because they'll do that sort of right away as a bonus action. And then, yes, I love this. Excellent. Oh, you all, this is fun. I like this. I'm excited about this. Okay. So we made it through our DOS Hit Squad combat. What screen are you all currently seeing? Is it this one? It's this one. Fantastic. All right. I love that. Anything else about this combat? Have a chat about the combat and about anything else that you all want to chat amongst yourselves about for just a minute. I need to go to the restroom quite desperately. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to do that. I'll leave up. I'm going to turn my camera off, but I will leave up um, these notes here for you all to have a look at. And uh, and that way you all can sort of see them and discuss them while I am away. I will be back very shortly.
Thank you. Uh, I love that I came back. I said, talk amongst yourselves, and I come back to a dog emote in the chat. That is exactly what I wanted. How did you know? How did you know that? Also, this shifter is a corgi shifter, and that is canon. Um, great. All right. So. Where is... Here we go. All right, so back to the adventure. So, we have managed to... Uh, managed to fix the combat, the Dosk Hit Squad combat, uh, so that it will actually challenge my fourth level players. All right, so... Let's continue on with this part of the adventure. Um, after the Dosk attack, Cole realizes she mistook the characters for assassins and apologizes. Uh, and she talks about some other stuff. Let's see if any of it is relevant or things that we need to change. Looks like it's mostly about Razor, her friend that was murdered by the Dosk operatives down there uh, in, the, in Old Sharn. Um, Razor served with Cole in the Siren military during the last war. That's fine. Uh, during which Cole lost her right arm. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. Uh, Razor and Cole had trouble finding work in Sharn. They were reluctant to hire Warforged foreigners. Uh, a month ago, Razor told Cole she had a job working on a long-term secret mission for Alden Dorian. Um, oh, Razor planned to save the money, then buy Cole a new arm so she could work with her. Because Cole's injury prevented her from doing the job. Oh my god, I love it. Razor would often come back from work sullen or wounded, but never opened up about the job until shortly before she died. Razor confessed that the job was more dangerous than it seemed when she was recruited, and she was planning to quit. Okay, so all of that is fine. We don't need to change any of that. Um, if Cole dies, here's what you can do to get more information. Okay. Development. While many of the House Orion members live in the House's Enclave and Terminus, the more powerful members of the Dragonmark family live in the upper wards of the city. If the characters ask around, they learn that Alden Dorian has a residence called the Unicorn Estate, I'm obsessed, in the Mithril Tower District of Upper Central Plateau. If they consult with Sergeant Vilroy, she suggests that they confront Alden Dorian, but cautions them, <laughs> and I know this is difficult for some groups, to be diplomatic. <laughs> Okay, great. I love that. So, the next part of this adventure takes us to Mithril Tower. Uh, I'm feeling good about this. I'm feeling good about the way this is going. We've been able to adjust some things. I like it, I like it, I like it. I really wish I could figure out why. Yeah, why aren't you? Oh, I'm a doofus. Oh, maybe not. There it is. I figured out how to get your names back up. I'm sorry yours wasn't up, Fluffy. fluffy. I feel bad because someone else followed after you. Anyway. Um, okay. So, we go to Mithril Tower. Uh, I will say again, because some different people might be here with us, um, I am going through and planning uh, the beginning of a new campaign for my home group, uh, which of course is not coming to my home anymore because social distancing. Uh, they are a party of fourth level Boromar clan crime syndicate operatives. Um, but the first thing that I'm running is the Forgotten Relics adventure in Eberron Rising for the Last War, which is built for first level characters. So part of what we're doing today is a adjusting the things that need to be adjusted for the for the level balance. And the other part of what we're doing today is just generally learning a little bit about Eberron and Sharn uh, and planting some seeds and coming up with some ideas for uh, the rest of the campaign arc that will springboard off of this published adventure. Um, so if you are planning on playing in for the Forgotten Relics adventure at any point, or if you don't want to be spoiled on it, that's basically all this stream is, is spoilers for the Forgotten Relics adventures. So I appreciate you being here, but perhaps it's not where you want to be right now. Um, also, if you are one of my players, I keep checking the, uh, the users in chat list. And I don't see any of them here, but if at any point some of you come in, uh, you're welcome to be here. I trust you to not metagame, but know that you're going to get some spoilers. So. It is a beautiful day outside. Um, I have the window open, so if you hear strange noises, but it's just gorgeous. All right. So, they get this information from Cole the Warforged, and we then go to, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully go to Mithril Tower. Mithril Tower is Sharn's most desirable downtown residential district in Upper Central Plateau, 
and is occupied by some of the city's wealthiest citizens. When the characters enter the district, there's some box text. The gates of Unicorn Estate are open, allowing characters to walk onto the property after first presenting themselves to the guards and stating their business. Okay, before we get too far into this, let's do what we did with uh, Tavik's Land Lower Tavik's Landing and High Wall. Let's go to this. I'm going to go to the section of Rising from the Last War and read a little bit about um, Upper Central Plateau and Mithril Tower in particular. So let's see. Central Plateau. The power, okay, Central Plateau. The power and wealth of Sharn are concentrated in Central Plateau. Whether you're looking to deal with powerful merchants, city councilors, dragon marked barons, which is who we're there for, or the ambassadors of other nations, excuse me, Ooh. Central Plateau is the place where big deals are made. All right, Central Plateau. I will once again only read the upper central uh, locations because that's where this part of the adventure takes place. In Platinum Heights, which is not where we're going, but that is okay, uh, there is the Aurora Gallery, the most prestigious auction house in Sharn. Aurora deals in magic items, exotic finds from Zendrik, and other wonders. Zendrik is the um, mysterious defunct dragon, uh, sorry, not dragon, uh, giant uh, continent uh, just off the coast of Corvair, if I'm remembering my map correctly. Uh, in Highest Towers in Upper Central, there is the City Archive. This enormous edifice holds the historical and legal records of Sharn and the surrounding regions. There's also Council Hall, which is where the City Council meetings are. Visitors can watch from the gallery. In Platinum Towers, there's the Grey Dragon Inn, which provides the aristocracy and wealthy uh, with lodging, if you can afford it. Koronath. Uh, the Koronath is the Temple of Kol Koran is an ostentatious display of wealth and a popular tourist attraction since many believe praying at the Koronath ensures success in business. Okay. Uh, Kundrak Bank of Sharn. So House Kundrak, which is another dragon marked house, oops, that deals with banking. I believe it's a dwarven house, if I remember correctly. Uh, their center of operations uh, in Sharn is here in Upper Central. There is Lirindar, uh, Lirindar, Lirindar? Tower, uh, which is an airship place. Airship travel to and from Sharn passes through the docking spires of Lirandar Tower, the house's primary enclave in Sharn. I have a feeling that's going to be important eventually. Sanids is one of Sharn's most celebrated restaurants. I love this. Sanids serves brelish cuisine of wealthy quality and has a legendary wine cellar. Love that. Uh, the vaults below the Kundrak Bank. The Wayfinder Foundation is the guild hall for this legendary association of explorers in Upper Central, and that's everything in Upper Central. Then there's some things in Middle Central. There doesn't seem to be a Lower Central, which is interesting. Uh, well, there is a Lower Central, but there's no uh, there's no noteworthy locations there. All right, now let's read the section about Upper Central. Gold and power flow down from Upper Central. Sounds like trickle-down economics, which... We all know doesn't work. Anyway, gold and power flow down from Upper Central. The District of Highest Towers is the seat of government, where City Hall and the Municipal Archives are located. The Koronath is the name of both the Central Financial District and the Grand Temple, which we talked about. Kundrak Bank is there. And their vaults. Some of Sharn's wealthiest citizens live ah, in the Mithril Tower District, and Platinum Heights is the most expensive market district in Sharn. Has fewer shops than the Bazaar of Dura, which is another district, but if you're looking for top quality goods or services, there's no finer or more expensive source to be found. If you maintain no better than a poor lifestyle, many people in Upper Central will assume that you're a servant or a vagrant. This could cause you to have disadvantage on charisma checks involving the residents here, and that's sort of funny. Uh, things you can do in the Central Plateau. Looking for amusement in this quarter? You can attend an auction. Plan a heist. <laughs> Go to jail. <laughs> Worship or engage in espionage. Okay. So Upper Central is the wealthy of the wealthy. Got it. Which makes sense because we're going to Mithril Tower where the scion of one of our dragon marked houses lives. All right. I have a feeling most of this will be fine to play as is, because it's mostly going to be role play. Uh, detect magic, reveals that the grounds of the Kanath estate radiate ours of abjuration and illusion. Um, 
Oh, this is cool. Any humanoid that takes a long rest in the estate can attune to the property of the estate as if they were attuning to a magic item. A creature attuned to Unicorn Estate can't be affected by enchantment spells of third level or lower while on its property unless it wishes to be. Hmm. When a creature not attuned to the estate enters the property, the illusion of a unicorn appears wherever the creature is and brays loudly, announcing its presence. Four human guards provide security to the estate, with two at the front and two following Alden around. Okay, cool. Um, Vishtai and Alden. Vishtai is his assistant, blah, blah, blah. Here's some stuff about role-playing Alden. Does not seem that he wants to talk to them because he's probably really worried about his son getting harmed if Dask finds out that he's talking to, well, adventures in general, much less Boromar adventures, if anyone can identify them as such. Tells a little bit about what's happening. Role-playing Vishtai also tells them a little bit about what's happening. I'm going to skip through this because I can just run it as is, and if you want to find out what is all in this section, then you should get your hands on Eberron Rising from the Last War. Uh, okay. Um, if the characters follow Vishtai's directions to Old Sharn, because Vishtai tells them he's a Kalashtar assistant of Alden Dorian, tells them a little bit about where to find, go down to Old Sharn, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I'm doing that thing that's annoying and just not really saying things. Okay. If the characters follow Vishtai's directions, they find a lift with an enclosed car that Dask uses to reach their section of the ruins of Old Sharn. Anyone wishing to use the lift must open a hidden panel and hotwire it. An out-of-order sign hangs above a nearby button, which opens the lift's doors. All right. Luna, a chaotic neutral female shifter, and Vani Irkardwan, a neutral female brellish human noble, are having a secret date on the lift. Oh my god, I'm obsessed. This is where they first met, so it's a frequent rendezvous. That's so weird. And I love it. They're bemused by the interruption and politely ask the party to leave, pointing out the lift is broken and growing more insistent and annoyed if the characters don't comply. Hilarious. So you can roleplay with them and do some checks. Um, they threaten to summon the guards. Uh, the guards arrest the party if the lift appears tampered with. Uh, okay, so whatever. If they have a fight, I mean, they're just city watch guards. There's no need to scale that up because story-wise, it doesn't make sense. Uh, this is just the story as it is. That's totally fine. Medusa panel. Okay, this is some ability check stuff to figure out how to hotwire it. We don't need to worry about that. If the characters can't find the hidden panel or figure out how to get the lift to Old Sharn, the lift eventually goes down, called to the tavern district of a Ladra's kitchen in Lower Central by Orgon, a male bugbear working for Dosk. Orgon wants to go down to Old Sharn's ruins to help the guard to help guard the relic's excavation site. If Luna and Vani are on the lift when Orgon enters, they leave immediately. When Orgon enters the lift, he demands the characters get out of the car. If the characters don't leave, Orgon attacks them. He fights until he's reduced to 10 hit points and then surrenders. A successful intimidation check gets him to admit to being a member of Dusk and to show the characters how to bring the lift down to the ruins of Old Sharn. Um... We could make this some sort of monstrous humanoid that's a little bit stronger than a bugbear. Um, we could also just leave this to the story being what it is. Um, hmm. I, you know, because this is just another Dosk member, uh, and it's worth showing that, like, all monstrous humanoids uh, might be a part of Dosk or at least come out of Droam. Uh, I think we'll leave it as a bugbear for right now, unless someone else has a great idea for something else that we should put in its place. But I'm okay leaving it as a bugbear. Um, not everything has to necessarily be balanced to, like, super challenge the party. All right. So, that gets us down to the next section of the adventure, saving Caden Dorian. Uh, replace it with a half-insect, half-bear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sure. Okay. All right. I can work with this. I like this. Um, what if we, let's see, where's my <laughs> half insect, half bear? I love it. Uh, let's, let's search the monster list for 
monstrosities. A bug. Oh, that's the joke that you're making. But I was too focused on actually doing what you asked to realize that that you were making a you're making a joke. A bug. Bear. Got it. All right, I'm keeping it as a bugbear. Very funny, fluffy. <laughs> that went right over my head. So, yeah, excellent. All right. Um, saving Caden Dorian. Uh, if the... You try, yes. Well, you succeed. If characters rescue Caden Dorian, his father can point the characters towards the boy's kidnapper, Gara. Okay, Dosk Excavation Site. There's probably going to be another combat in here that we can talk about shortly. When the characters take the lift down to Dosk Excavation Site, read this box text. Not going to read it right now. Cavern is irregular in shape and hundreds of feet in diameter. Its uneven ceiling ranges in height from 15 to 30 feet. Uh, the ground and the pit count as difficult terrain because they're covered in rubble. Four Dask goblins guard this area and rely on dark vision to see. They hide in the pit when the characters arrive and leap out to attack. Da -da 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 -da. Here's how you can deal with it if they're trying to hide. Surprise. You can try and intimidate them. Excavation pit. Oh. It's also the workers holding area. There's a warforged corpse at the bottom of the pit, and 11 other warforged in various states of disrepair sit chained together on the pit floor. Um, if the party frees them, the warforged scatter to other parts of the cogs, grateful for the rescue. They might assist the party in a future adventure if you so choose. That feels like it could be useful for later. Okay, so let's talk about this, because this feels like another like encounter combat setup piece. Um, which, of course, who knows how the party will end up dealing with it. But right now we have four goblins. Um, which, of course, is n not much to deal with. Um, now, I could leave this as is because, you know, uh, story and these goblins are what's there. But we can probably do better. So these four goblins for a party of five uh, first level characters constitute a hard challenge rating, a hard difficulty of the encounter. Um, so let's see what we can do. Now, we could do the same thing that we did before. We could uh, slap on some NPC stat blocks to the goblin basic stat block. Uh, so giving them, basically giving nimble escape to a an NPC stat block. But what if this time we went and looked for um, at least... Let's let's try looking for just a different monster altogether, a slightly, a slightly uh, scarier, higher CR monster. So I'm gonna flip us back over here. And right now we are filtering monstrosities, which is what we want. Let's go ahead and do challenge rating. Let's say one to eh, we'll say three. Although that's probably gonna end up being too too difficult. All right, let's see what we got. I don't think we're going to use Lobster Folk. <laughs> no, it looks like something from Ravnica. Death Dog, not intelligent enough. I don't suppose I can... Um, senses, save, proficiency. Nah, can't get that specific. That's okay. Are there any goblin variants in Volos that could help? Oh, that's interesting. Um, let's get... You know what? Let's do all month because I'm not sure where they'll be. So let's just take off all of this. I don't remember there being goblin variants, but let's check. Oh, there's goblin boss that we could throw in. That's not. That's from the monster manual. Uh, oh, sorry. I probably shouldn't put it up here, but um, that's here. I'm going to send you back to the other one while I take a look at the goblin boss, see what the actual difference is. They get a multi-attack, and they can use a reaction to choose another goblin within five feet of it to switch places and become the target instead. That's funny. Um, we could do that. A bar guest. Oh, that's interesting. Also, hi. Welcome back, Ish. <laughs> um, okay, so I like maybe replacing one of the goblins with a goblin boss. Oh, wow. Barghast is CR4. We could totally do it, but we would definitely want to reduce the number of 
enemies in this combat if we include the bar guest. Let's see. don't remember much about these. Long ago, McGlooby at bargained, blah, 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 blah. Oh, gracious. They, they devour goblinoid souls. Mission of every bar guest is to consume 17 goblinoid souls by devouring the bodies of those it killed. Gracious. Add a goblin boss or two to the goblin encounter. That's sort of what I'm thinking, Fluffy. Um is just switch, swap out a couple of those and call it a day. Um, I really like the bar guest. We're going to keep it in mind for future things, but I think it's a little too, a little too much. Um, okay, so what if... Let's switch us back here. All right, so I've got my uh, party of five fourth level characters. So what if... Let's see. So we originally start with... Uh, yeah, see... Even if I keep four goblins and add a goblin boss, it's still, or two goblin bosses, it's still giving me an easy encounter, which is not the end of the world. Look, I don't have to match the difficulty level for every one of these. This is my campaign, our campaign, right? It doesn't all have to be super challenging. I do happen to know that these players um, have been playing D&D for a long time. Uh, when I joined the group six years ago, which was still during the, well, I joined right before 5e came out, but they had played through the 4th edition era and kept up with 3.5 rules. Um, and I know that several of them really like crunchy combat and things like that. So when I throw a combat at them like this, um, that is more likely than not to become an encounter, a combat encounter, full out, you know, battle, um, I do like to challenge them a little bit because um, they enjoy that sort of thing. So let's think about what else we could, let's not do that. Let's think about what else we could do here. Let me go back to searching my, cause maybe I love the idea of the goblin boss and a couple of goblins, but maybe there's something else also, right? Um, let's just look for one to two, how about? Oh, there's another train. Um, okay. Oh, we could, okay. A harpy is definitely possible for something, somebody that works for um, Dusk and is from Droam. Don't hate that. Um, Terrafolk, Kruthig, Ankeg, Carrion Crawler, Centaur, Ettercap, eh. Grick, Griffin, Marrow. I'm looking for something that's got some intelligence and like some society, like some ability for society and language and that kind of stuff with them, which is why I'm just skipping over things like Grick's and, and that sort of thing. Um, okay. Well, we could add some more creatures by adding in a harpy, but at that point that doesn't, it's a CR1 also, and it doesn't feel particularly, is this basic? Yes. Okay. So I can show this. It doesn't feel particularly, I don't know. Some, using the Luring Song and having a Harpy in there just, to me, sort of changes the whole feel of the encounter. Um, I wish... What does that say? I wish your players could know how much love you pour into your encounters. Oh, um, yeah. And, and I don't to every single encounter, right? Because I recognize that sometimes it doesn't matter. I also recognize that sometimes they're going to avoid uh, fighting or avoid the encounter altogether. Um, but when it's something like this that I know they're going to run up against, they're going to have to interact with it at least, you know, on some moderate level... Uh, particularly in this situation where we're just starting a new campaign, it's worth it's worth taking a little time on them. Um, also, the crit was full of love. You just don't know it. Ha! Uh, also, I, I want to make sure that we're establishing, because I've got some players who know nothing about Eberron, so I want to make sure that we're establishing some things about the world. Add a couple of wolves. Oh, actually, that's a good idea. The other... I could do... What if we did... Uh, uh. What if we had some dire wolf mounts for our goblins? That's CR1. Okay, what if we do this? Let's have a look at this. What if we did... Um, okay, that's, that's getting us somewhere, right? So we've got two goblin bosses, two regular goblins, and two dire wolves that they're riding on. 
What about, what's the CR for, I can do it here. What's the CR for a warg? Uh, it's only one half. Now we're going to do the direwolf. Um... Okay, I kind of like this. And it's only medium, but that's a lot of creatures to deal with, right? And you can definitely deal with them in different ways, right? The wolves in particular, if the, if the riders get unmounted, right, unseated, um, then you can deal with the dire wolves in different ways. Yeah. Um, I think this is good. And it's it's a little bit easier than normal, but that's okay with me. That's okay with me at this point. Um... I like this. I think I like this. Now, please, as I type this up, and I'm going to move this over. As I type this up, though, uh, please feel free to toss out other ideas uh, as you have them. But for right now, this is... Move that down. This is the Saving Caden Combat. Okay. So we started with, I'm just going to keep these notes here, existing combatants. What did I put down here? Uh, and these, oh, there is a thing about, or was that the, oh, I've lost track. Um, the goblins fight until one remains who flees into the ruins. Fight until one goblin left. Okay. And so we should have four goblins. But what we're actually going to do is two goblin bosses, two goblins, two dire wolves mounts. Great. I like this a lot. Any other thoughts and feelings? Add, uh, nope, I already said that. Add a couple of wolves. Yep, that was a great idea. Mounts, love that. Okay, this feels pretty good. I like this. I think we'll stick with this. Let me know if you have other ideas, but I'm going to go ahead and move on with the adventure at this point, because that was a pretty pretty easy and straightforward thing to deal with. All right, so they deal with that. They can try and get some information out of the remaining goblin if they manage to keep him alive. Caden Dorian, they can save him. Um, thieves tools to pick the chains that he's in, or you can do an athletics check to try and break them. Oh, fun. Any character who succeeds on a DC-11 intelligence investigation check finds the manacle's lock is smeared with oil of taggot. Any character that attempts to pick the lock without gloves is exposed to the poison and must succeed on a constitution saving throw or become poisoned for 24 hours. The poison creature is unconscious. It wakes up if it takes damage. That's fun. I love a little trap on a lock that isn't just like a chest or a door. Um... All right, role-playing Caden, he needs assistance. Uh, the goblins have some treasure on them. Uh, I think we can probably leave the treasure as it is, because that's not going to be this party's main source of income anyway, so if they really want to loot these goblins, that's fine with me. It doesn't matter. Okay, optional encounter, ghost of, of Finkston Nezalech. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's how I'm choosing to say it. When the characters decide to leave the Dosk excavation site, excavation site and return to the City of Towers, Old Sharn's ruins reveal one final surprise. Obviously, we're going to do it. The ghost of a gnome inquisitive who died when the Old City collapsed during the War of the Mark, that was a long time ago, rises from the rubble and looks quizzically at the party. This encounter is optional. Its purpose is to provide a fun way to give some background on the city, which I'm absolutely going to take advantage of. The ghost's name is Finkston Nezalech. I've got it. I'm going to put this in chat because it is hilarious. Finkston Nezalech. And he's been dead for over 500 years. Okay. The encounter can take as long as you'd like. Consider mentioning some of the different wards of the city you'd like the party to know about. Oh. All right. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Finkston's dress, mannerisms, and lack of contemporary knowledge mark him as belonging to a bygone era. He's cursed to walk this section of the ruins investigating a jewel heist that by now can't possibly be solved. Fair. He's eager to question the party about their whereabouts on the night of the heist and if they have any leads. If one or more party members opts to spend an hour listening <laughs> to Finkston's theories and following him in his search of the ruined area, they witness Finkston finding his skeleton, uh-oh, tucked in a rubble-strewn corner, Oh no, upon finding his bones, Finkston looks amazedly about at the party before fading away. Hmm. 
Anyone who assisted him gains advantage on wisdom perception or intelligence investigation checks for the next 24 hours. Okay, this is cute. Um, huh. So this is definitely something that uh, we want to... Hey, Tundra Colt, welcome. Uh, this is definitely something that we can use to do a little bit of a lore drop about Sharn. Now, <laughs> the fun and perhaps unfortunate part about that is that I don't know everything there is to know about... It looks like I, my number's wrong. Um, I don't know everything there is to know about Sharn yet, so I'm not sure what I should uh, put in this section. Anyone in here, like, well-versed in Sharn and have, like, a couple of things that you want to toss out about um, what people should know about Sharn? The other option is we can come back to this encounter later once we've sort of gotten through the rest of uh, this adventure. We can use this encounter with Finkston Zelich, Zezelich, Zezelich, uh, to sort of tie in some stuff for what comes next. Does that make sense? So like once we get through this adventure and, and I, we have an idea of maybe what things we want to guide the players to for the next part of their campaign, we can come back and use Finkston, Finkston uh, to have introduced some of those things. So I think we're going to do that. I think let's do that rather than just like lore dumping stuff about Sharn. Like that's not interesting or fun. Um, I mean, it is for me, because I'm a big lore nerd, uh, but you know what I mean. Um, okay, great. So we're going to come back to that. So let me just make a little note here that we want to... Um, Finkston Zezelech encounter. And we just want to um, return and design based on what happens next after Forgotten Relics. Is that what this adventure is called? <laughs> yes, Forgotten Relics. Okay, great. Great, I love that. No problem, no problem. Okie dokie. So we're going to move on past this little encounter. We will come back to it. The next, nope, that's the wrong screen. Okay, so next, in theory, the characters have Kate and Dorian safely in their possession, in their, nope, not in their possession, that's weird, um, with them, let's say, and uh, they can return him, hopefully safely, to, I only got the book at Christmas, so I'm not going to be any help, haven't read it yet either, been too busy. I, I've had the, so I am fortunate enough that D&D Beyond supports my actual play podcast, and so I get all of the books on D&D Beyond as soon as they're released. I have not read through this one all the way either, uh, Tundra Cold, so, so no worries at all. I'm vaguely familiar with Eberron and Sharn, but this is a learning experience for me to... Um, I'm behind on reading this one, which means that I'm even further behind on reading uh, Wildmount. I like to think of Sharn as being very much like the city in Metropolis. That is to say, the movie Metropolis, or even the anime Metropolis. Um, oof, living the life of man. <laughs> uh, I am I am very fortunate and very grateful to D&D Beyond uh, and all of their amazing people in there that they support our podcast um, by giving us insider access. I really appreciate them. Um, they're amazing. Go use their services and shout their amazingness from the rooftops they're they're now i'm just waxing poetic about them but I'm, I'm friends with several of their staff and i think they're amazing they're all really good people who are really excited about this game and are doing amazing things that is all i will say moving on um i do not know the anime metropolis um although my boyfriend is getting me to watch uh lots of anime lately because he really enjoys it and i just i don't not enjoy it i just haven't watched much um so maybe i'll add that one to the list um Cool. Okay, so if they return Caden to his father at the Unicorn Estate, he is uh, their, uh, Alden, the dad, is overjoyed. He's saddened by the death of the Warforged that he hired to work for Dusk. Oh, that's good. He's a good person. I like that. A noble with a good heart. But he doesn't regret the actions that kept his son alive. Fair enough. Um, Alden thanks the characters, tells them everything he knows, which is all the information contained in the first three paragraphs of Story Overview. Okay, fine. In addition, he gives the characters the address of a terminus apartment in Lower Tavik's Landing that Gara uses as a safe house and a place to store the books and schemas, schemas? Whatever. Found in Old Sharn's ruins. 
When the characters have all the information they need from Alden to find Gara, the Orion heir offers them a sum of 50 gold to leave his name and House Orion out of their report to the Sharn Watch. I don't know that they're going to be reporting to the Sharn Watch, but whatever. To leave it out of the report, fine. Easy enough. Alden is deeply ashamed of being manipulated in this way, and he doesn't want to tarnish his reputation or that of his house. A character who succeeds on a, an intimidation or persuasion check gets Alden to raise the amount to 100 gold. <laughs> If the characters report Alden's actions to the Watch, he manages to bury the scandal on his own, but the characters become his enemies. That's not a great thing for them, if they want to travel anywhere ever. That's via House Orients. Anyway, uh, okay. If the characters conclude their business with the Alden family on friendly terms, he offers his residence as a place where they can rest and grab a bite to eat before moving on. Fine. As a gesture of goodwill and thanks, Vishtai offers each character a unicorn-shaped feather token inset with the sigil of House Orion. That's going to be useful in this next part. I have a feeling. All right. Skycoach Ride. Next section. When the characters were off rescuing Caden, Dorian, Gara, who is the Dask lieutenant in charge of this operation, captured and interrogated Sergeant Vilroy. Oh, no. And learned about the characters meddling. In this section, Gara orders a changeling named Jass to adopt Sergeant Vilroy's appearance and lead the characters into a trap. This is exciting. I have to say, and I'm, I wonder if there's, let me see if I can find it. Um, this is a great, so far I'm seeing this is, it's a well-written adventure, right? It does all the things. It's, it's got good balance, all that stuff. What I'm really impressed by with this adventure is it's doing an amazing job so far, in my opinion, of introducing new players to Eberron in general and Sharn in particular, right? We've already interacted with a Shifter, a Warforged, and now a Changeling, right? So we're introducing the three new species, and, and a Kalistar. So all four of the new species, races, whatever, in Eberron. Um, we, we have dealt with a Dragonmarked House. We've gone to several different districts of Sharn. Uh, we have learned about Dask, a little bit about Dask, and about monstrous humanoids, and that they're not what we think of monstrous humanoids being in other settings, right? I think that's super cool. Um, sorry, just received a surprising text message. Okay. Um... Anyway, I think it's doing a really remarkable job of uh, of introducing this setting to new players. I think it's really well done. I am curious if there is... Nope. I was wondering if there, in the credits, if there was a specific credit for this adventure. But it doesn't look like there is. Um, oh, who's following now? I missed it on my... Missed it over here. Tundra Cult. Oh, hey, thanks for the follow, Tundra Cult. I appreciate it. Um, getting closer. Okay, where was I? What was I talking about? Um, oh, it's a great adventure. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So Jass is coming to uh, talk uh, in the guise of Sergeant Vilroy is going to approach the characters. So uh, Jass approaches the characters in the guise of Sergeant Vilroy sometime after they leave Mithril Tower. Read the box task. Not going to read that now. Um, Vilroy urges the characters to board the Sky Coach. Ah, okay. And share what they've learned thus far. If the characters mention Gara's safe house, the changeling tells them there's no time to waste and suggests the Sky Coast, it's the Sky Coach, is the fastest means of getting there. If the characters ask how the sergeant found them, the changeling replies, oh, I work for the Sharn Watch. Knowing things is my job. Okay. If they accept the ride, the Sky Coach takes them to area T1 of Terminus, which is the next section. Unknown to Jass, Gara has also arranged for a Dask strike team to attack the Sky Coach en route. Wow. Wow, that's so shitty of Gara. Hire this changeling, or order this changeling, to go trick the play the player characters and then attack the, the Sky Coach that your operative is in. Wow. Okay, cool. I like this. So, uh, right, so they're going to attack the Sky Coach. Any character who suspects that Vilroy is hiding something can make an inside check, cross this deception check. 
they might notice, if they win the check, they might notice that there's differences in the sergeant's facial expression, suggesting that she's not the same person the party interacted with previously. Jess doesn't have any details, doesn't have details of any prior conversations the party had with the real Sergeant Vilroy, and she flubs any sustained questioning. Interesting. All right. If the characters realize they're not dealing with the real Vilroy and confront the changeling, Jess leaps out of the sky coach, uses a feather token to land safely, and flees into the crowded city. So cool. Each character has one turn to act before the unpiloted sky coach crashes. Fun, fun, fun. Character proficient with air vehicles who makes a successful intelligence check as an action. Uh, gains control of the coach and stops it from falling. If it crashes, they're thrown from it. Use the falling in Sharn table in chapter three. Love that. To determine what happens to the characters who fall. The party has three rounds to catch Jass before the changeling adopts a new guise. If they capture Jass, the changeling reveals that Gara is leaving Sharn on a lightning rail bound for Rote, which I believe is the capital of Breland, I think. Uh, the changeling doesn't know about Gara's trap and simply has instructions to deliver the characters. Okay. That's fine. Um, let's see. The only thing I want to check... Okay, changelings have deception plus five. That seems fine to me. So we don't need to worry about that. Um, okay, I don't think we have to work on anything here. All right, so we move on to the characters. Uh, then, uh, you know, they've dealt with, with Jass in whatever way they're going to deal with them. And the characters continue on to Terminus, either by foot or sky coach. And they are accosted. Aha, here's another encounter. They're accosted by a Dask strike team consisting of five gnolls. Now, fortunately, we do, as Fluffy mentioned earlier when we were looking for goblin alternatives, we have a ton of gnoll alternatives from Volo's Guide. So we'll look at some of those in just a moment. Gara has sent the gnolls to kill the characters if possible, or at least soften them up before they arrive at her Terminus safe house. That's really funny. Um, okay. Each knoll rides a magical three-foot diameter disc that can support up to 250 pounds. A creature on a disc can use its bonus action to move the disc up to 60 feet in any direction, fast enough to keep pace with the sky coaches of Sharn. That was very clever of them. A disc otherwise hovers in place. These discs were created using a spell similar to Tensor's floating disc that was cast by a Dask wizard who does not appear in this adventure. Fair. Uh, the spell ends in 30 minutes, after which they disappear. I suppose it tells us that... It's similar to Tensor's Floating Disc. Oh, none of my characters have third-level spells, so they can't cast a spell magic anyway. So, moving on. The gnolls... Aw, no free hoverboards. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe it'll give them the idea for how to make hoverboards of their own. Although, let's look at our character list. I don't think any of them can cast anything like that. Oh, the... I don't think Tensor's Floating Disc is a sorcerer spell, is it? So, no, probably not. Can a bard? Not the point. All right. Uh... <laughs> Um, gnolls initially keep their distance, peppering the characters with arrows. The gnolls become frustrated and close to melee range if the characters take advantage of cover, and the gnolls' ranged attacks prove ineffective. Once three of the four gnolls are disposed of, the remainder flee on their discs or on foot. Okie dokie. So, let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at some gnoll variants. Now, Just get it queued up, and then I'll shift you all over to my D&D Beyond screen. Okay, here we go. Um, oopsie. Let's move this over so you can actually see them. There we go. All right. So, basic gnolls, four of them at one half CR. At this point, I feel like it's safe to assume that the party has reached second level, right, if we're doing XP, um, which I think the adventure must assume, because I haven't seen anything anywhere at this point about... Uh, milestone leveling and getting the characters to second, but they've definitely gotten to second. So four CR one halves for four to six second level players. Um, great. I mean, the only ones that are higher CR, I don't think we're going to use the Fang of Yinagu because that's a little much. So we'll, oh, uh, we can use the Pack Lord. And we can look at the Fleshnar. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to take you all off the screen because those are not basic rules. Monsters. Um, okay, so the Fleshnar, which is the CR1 enemy. Um, let me just also open up the regular gnolls. So regular gnolls can rampage. They have a bite, spear, and a longbow attack. The Fleshnars have rampage and a bite and a short sword attack, although they do get multi-attack and regular gnolls do not. 
They can also do the sudden rush action in which the until the end of the turn, the null speed increases by 60 feet and it doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. Interesting, not super useful since they're probably mostly going to be um, using those discs, at least at first. So I think what we would do... Let's see, AC is actually slightly lower on the Flesh Nars, and hit points is exactly the same. So I don't think the Flesh Nar is actually going to be useful to us here. I'm also, <laughs> I have to be honest, I'm a little confused why the Flesh Nar is CR1 when the regular Null is CR... Oh, I guess it's the multi-attack, right? Okay, so we could give our regular Null some multi-attack. That would be fine. Let's have a look at the Pack Lord. Packlord also gets multi-attack, has significantly more hit points, uh, slightly hot... Nope, identical AC. Oh, our Nulls are going to have AC 13 because they're using longbows, and so they won't be able to use their shields. That's fine. The Packlord, however, can incite Rampage. One creature the Null can see within 30 feet of it can use its reaction to make a melee attack if it can hear the Null and has the Rampage trait. Okay, cool. So let's do this. Let's... Switch one of the gnolls to a gnoll pack lord and give our regular gnolls multi attack. Um, the flesh nar. Whoa, flesh nar has three attacks. I feel like we can probably give them two. Yeah, how do we feel about that? So, four gnolls, one of them is a pack lord, and the other three are basic gnolls, but they have. Uh, let's say a two attack multi attack that they can use uh, with their long sword, their long bow, or their bite. How do we feel about that? Let me go make some notes in here. So this is what is this? Um, Dask Knolls. Dask Knolls encounter. All right, so. Existing. What do I, 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 combatants, okay. The other thing I like that I've noticed uh, is that all of these encounters so far, the, like the end point of the encounter, at least as written, uh, seems fair, uh, say Fluffy and Tundra Cold. Cool. The thing that I actually find really interesting about all of these combat encounters so far is that there is a they flee mechanic right? Which, like, makes perfect sense to me. Uh, sort of in general, in a lot of combat situations, like, are you really going to fight to the death? Yes, there are some cases in which you're going to fight to the death. But I appreciate that, like, all, most of the, all of the enemies? Yeah, all of the enemies, I think, at this point, that we have fought have been Dask agents who, like, are not going to risk their lives if they can help it, right? So, this is really interesting, because in this case, we, the, uh, Fight. I would recommend reading The Monsters Know What They're Doing. Ah, oh, I really want to copy that book. I met the author very briefly at PAX East, and I didn't have a chance to actually talk to him. Um, and I really, I should get a copy of it. Um, fight until one, until one null left. This is definitely, um, this group of players is definitely a group that I can run Monsters as being fairly intelligent. Um, if you do audiobooks, it's out in audio form now. I I don't do audiobooks only because if I have time to listen to something, chances are I'm listening to a podcast, and I'm way behind in my podcasts right now. Um, but I should just buy the book, honestly. I support, you know, creators, indie creators and such. Um, so I may, I may do that after we're done today. Um, okay, so existing consultants are four uh, uh, four nulls, but what we're actually going to do is one null pack lord and three nulls with a two attack multi attack, and that's all we have to do. Problem solved. Um, I don't really know why I felt the need to give myself quite that much space. Ah! Ah! There we go. Um, great. Okay, that looks good to me. Let's move forward. Okay, so they deal with that, whatever. They uh, will hopefully dispose of three of the gnolls and the remainder uh, flee on foot. 
Oh, there are supposed to be five nulls, <laughs> not four, um, which is fine. We'll just change this and change this. I don't think we really have to. I don't think we really have to mess with it any more than that. Um, all right. While I move on to Terminus, I just realized that I have not done this yet, but some shameless self-promotion since I'm seeing a few people in here that I don't uh, know particularly well. So if you're enjoying this planning, you should check out my podcast. Anyway, okay, that's all that I'm self-promotion I'm going to do for right now because I'm having a good time and I want to keep going. Okay, now Terminus. So, okay, I should say now we're in Terminus and Terminus has maps, which I assume that playing through Terminus is basically going to be a little bit more like dungeon crawly, on the grid, blah, blah, blah. I probably will run Theater of the Mind, but that's the type of stuff that we're approaching here in this next section is, you know, our version of a Sharn dungeon, right? A Sharn upper, or above ground, you know, not in in the lower city, or, I mean, not in the old Sharn or whatever dungeon. Okay, do I have any coffee left? Oh, I do. Y'all, I got me a mug warmer from a desk and it's a life changer. All right. Um, Terminus in Lower Tavix Landing is named for Terminus Station, a massive house Orion enclave that serves as the endpoint for the Orion Lightning Rail. We got a map. It's near Rowan's Gate. Most travelers entry point into Sharn. It bustles with crowds, pickpockets, con artists, and other criminals looking to take advantage of the cities. I need me a mug warmer, says Tundra. Uh, says Tundra Cold. Yeah, it's, it's a game changer. I can't even tell you. Uh, Gara has an apartment in... Welcome back from Aaron's ish I'm glad you're back. Apartment in Terminus where she left a map for... I was talk texting. Good. <laughs> uh, it's an apartment in Terminus where she left a trap for the characters. Keep getting into a game or work, and then I take a sip and all of a sudden my tea is cold. Yeah, that's what was happening to me, and so I either... I just wasn't finishing cups of coffee um, or tea, or I was, like, downing them in a hurry to, like, get it over with, which is not the way I want to, like, enjoy my coffee throughout the day also whoa how did it get to be 10 after 4 y'all how long have we been going you all are the best hanging out with me i have to say this has been super fun two and a half hours okay that's not bad um i hope you all have been enjoying i'm having a an absolute blast uh and this is super helpful and i'm very excited uh for this campaign with people because you all have really helped me to like flesh out some stuff change up some stuff and i'm very very excited um all righty Alrighty, Rue. Where is my? I keep. I've got so. If you all could see my full layout, I've got so many things open right now. I don't know where anything is. Okay. Um, Terminus in lower tabics. Oh, I already read that. Uh, right. So there's a trap at Gara's ap apartment. The half ogre took the books and schemas recovered in Ultron's ruins and boarded a lightning rail bound for Rote. That's about to leave Terminus Station. Rut row. Do it more. Also, I'm glad to see you have more followers. Let's get you to 50, says Ish. Yes, I agree. I hope you all continue to have fun. I need to bugger off and take the doggos on a walk. Oh, Fluffy, it is. I'm so glad that you hung out. Um, say hi to the doggos for me uh, and, and enjoy the walk. I will definitely do this more. I think I've probably got another hour to 90 minutes max in me for this session just because like I'm getting hungry and my brain is starting to go a little bit more slowly but um I think we're playing our first session of this ooh, tomorrow night so there's a chance depending on how much we get done that I may hop back on tomorrow afternoon uh same ish time to sort of wrap things up and and do some other things to prep um so have a great time thank you for hanging out fluffy um and I will I will talk to you soon um for the rest of us let us carry on i'm making a quick check of the okay great uh okay so she left a trap she took all the stuff from old sharn and is on a lightning rail bound for rote i am so easily distracted but i really want to know if i'm correct that rote is the capital of breland so Ha! I am correct. It is the capital of Breland. Okay. See, I'm I'm learning things. I'm getting there. Are you streaming this Eberron game? I'm not. This is for my uh, this is for my home group, um, and we we've been playing. They've been playing together for ten plus years. I joined them a little over or a little under six years ago. Um, but we just play for ourselves. We're playing online now because social distancing or physical distancing. Um, 
but but no, we we don't stream this one. Uh, we like to keep this for us. We get a little blue and off color at times, and um, we've known each other for long enough that like we uh, we still use safety tools and we know each other's limits and things. But we're able to be a little bit a, a little bit bluer and a little bit more off color and a little bit more um, rowdy than I am comfortable uh, doing in front of other people, right? Because I don't always know my viewers sort of limits and tolerances for things. Um, and, and quite frankly, my limits and tolerances for things sort of change based on the group of people that I'm with. Um, so, so yeah, we stick this one, we keep this one private for us. Um, your home group is lucky. Oh, thank you, Ish. Uh, they're a good group. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They're the ones really that taught me D&D, uh, six, about six years ago, right before fifth edition came out. Um, they're a, they're a good bunch of folks. Anyway. All right, we in Terminus. Uh, the buildings in Terminus are made of stone. You can climb them. Blah, 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 blah. Doors are made of wood. Okay, this is all. I can't wait to things are going for your campaign. I'm doing an Eberron game right now, and I love it so much. Fair one. I'd love to know how it goes. Thinking of planning an Eberron campaign. Cult, uh, Tundra and and ish. Yeah, I will definitely update you all, and like I'll I'll post little updates on Twitter too. Um, like after or maybe during. <laughs> uh the game and i think maybe i mean i've got the time nowadays you know so maybe we'll do um some regular weekly planning or checking in about this campaign um of course i will talk to the to the players about that uh because this is all stuff that you know doesn't directly involve them yet but once we get into their stories too i will check with them and make sure that they're they're cool with me continuing to share this excuse me um all right so we're talking about terminus features uh, wood door sorry doors walls blah 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 Locked doors. None of that needs to change. Everbright lanterns are illuminating all the interior areas. Uh, they've got windows. Fine. Um, if somebody shoves somebody up against a window, you can break the glass and make them fall. This is thrilling. Bystanders in Terminus. Terminus has busy streets. Most of the visitors and residents flee at the first sign of trouble, because they know. However, some bystanders might assist the party in their fight with Dusk. Kraz, described below, is one example of a helpful bystander. Kraz is a Knoll Porter who has endured several run-ins with Dask criminals in the past and bears them no love. At the time of your choosing, Kraz rushes a member of Dask and knocks the affected creature prone. Consider having Kraz intervene in area T14. Oh, I love that. And I don't have to change his stats because he's just a porter who is there. Um, this is another great example of teaching things about Eberron. Uh, in this case, teaching that the monstrous humanoids that we uh, assume, that many people assume from other settings are automatically evil. Uh, this Null Porter is just some poor bystander who, you know, doesn't like Dask. Um, it's like what we do with the Shimmer Scale Kobolds in my podcast. Like, they're they're good. They're cool. They're fun. We like them. Mm -hmm. If somebody falls and doesn't have a Feather Fall token or spell at the ready, use the Falling and Sharn table. Blah, 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 blah. Sharn watch guards. Um, give me just a sec, y'all. It's, it's a lovely day outside, but the sun is going down, and I'm getting some wind in here, and now it's cold. So give me just a second. I'm going to go close my window. Uh, I will be right back. I'll leave everything up. I'm just going to turn my camera off real quick. Okay. All right. That's a little better. Still got the nice natural light, but I'm not so cold. Now, uh... Oh, Sharn Watch Guards. The Sharn Watch has a modest presence in Terminus. Its guards defend wealthy visitors in the holdings of House Orion. If combat breaks out in the streets, or if a bystander calls for the Sharn Watch, roll a d20 on initiative count zero during each round the disturbance occurs. On an 18 or higher, 1d4 watch guards arrive and attempt to arrest anyone involved in a crime. Amazing. Okay, fine. That can stay the way it is. Dask forces. Several members of Dask are stationed in Terminus, ready to attack the characters to give Gara a chance to get away. Unless otherwise noted, members of Dask attack the characters, fighting until reduced to half hit points and then fleeing. Again, I love that. If any member of Dask is captured, a character who makes a successful intimidation check gets the member to reveal that Gara is leaving Sharn on a lightning rail bound for Rote. Changeling Treachery. If the characters are traveling with Jass still, the Changeling attempts to lead them into the trap laid in Gara's safe house. The Changeling attacks the characters the first time they battle other members of Dusk. 
which I assume if we've made it this far, now this is interesting, because if we've made it this far with Jass, that means they've already encountered that null strike force that we worked on just a minute ago. Um, and so in that case, Jass didn't tip their hand at that point that they were in fact a Dask operative. Interesting. Okay. Okay, I gotta kind of think about that. That seems a little weird to me, and here's why. Because it said earlier that Jas doesn't know that Gara is getting that Null Strike Force to attack the party in the Sky Coach, or, or more to the point, to attack the Sky Coach, which endangers Jas also. And it feels like they'd be pissed. But I guess they know to follow orders and to take, you know, to do whatever they can to take the take the characters to Gara's apartment. I don't know if anybody has thoughts on that. That feels a little like uh, they adjusted one, like maybe one part of this adventure was adjusted uh, and then they didn't adjust the other part. I'm not sure. Well, to be honest, I'm not sure what the odds are that Jas is still going to be with them anyway at this point. But if they are, that feels a little odd to me. So I got to think about that. I got to think about that. Okay, anyway. Um, where is Terminus Station? At some point during their exploration of Terminus, the characters learn that Gara has boarded a lightning rail, getting ready to leave Sharn if they don't already know that. If the characters ask any bystanders, they learn the location of the lift, Area T10, that leads to Terminus Station. Fine. Okay. Um, right. And then we have a map with a bunch of areas laid out. It does not represent the entirety of the Terminus District, obviously but shows the most likely places that the characters uh, might explore during this adventure. Fine. All right, so we start with, and we're just gonna go through these and see where there are um, encounters that might need to be adjusted and where there are encounters that, for the story, like probably just should be left as they are, uh, and go from there. So T1 is the Sky Coach platform. Crowd of a bunch of commoners and some nobles is gathered on the platform. We don't have to change that because those are those are just people. They are who they are. The Doc Sky Coach belongs to an off-duty professional driver named Belga Twillo. The chain anchoring the Sky Coach on the Doc has this these stats. A character who makes a successful thieves tool check can pick the lock. A care bystander who oh this is oh funny this is in case they try and steal this Sky Coach. Okay fine that's fun. Uh, Commerce Stair leads to the Skycoach platform. Tenement Tower Stairs, blah, 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 blah. Top level apartments. Okay, the doors to both of these apartments are locked. T4A, Marticia's apartment. Marticia Calandra, a neutral female brellish human mage right, lives in a modestly furnished studio apartment. If the characters break into the 80-year-old's apartment, Marticia flees, fighting for her life if she must. Oh. Badass. Uh, if the characters knock on her door, Marticia shouts to them through the doorway to go away. <laughs> Persuasion check to convince her to talk to the characters. If asked about Gara, Marticia does give them the following information. She has a half-orc neighbor who lives in the other apartment on this floor. Never bothered Marticia, but does have loud guests, including Droam immigrants. Marticia saw the half-orc leave minutes before the characters arrived. Fine. Gara's living area when they arrive here for... Ha! Okay. So this is Gara's apartment where the trap is set. Um, four Kenku cut purses working for Dask hide in groups, two groups of two. One behind a couch, one behind a table, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Let's, and there's another section. Let me just read the other section, which is of Gara's apartment. That was her living area. And then in her bedroom, Noor, a Dask knoll, is burning Gara's documents as ordered by the half owner. <laughs> of the documents that remain on the floor, two are of interest. One's a receipt for a lightning rail ticket, and the other uh, contains the list of names and addresses of the Warforged hired to work in the ruins of Old Sharn. You can add other documents that could act as story hooks for future adventures. Okay, so I'm going to add that to our little list of things that we have, right? Because we've got this just like here with Fistington, Fissing, no, Fingston Zelech, Ze Zezelech. Uh, that we could maybe use for future adventure hooks. So this is also one that we can possibly use for future adventure hooks. Good to know. 
Uh, Sergeant Germain Vilroy, oh, is restrained and unconscious, currently has five hit points remaining. After getting the information she needed from Germain, Gara knocked her out using oil of Taggett. A character can remove the ropes binding the sergeant as an action. If the characters wake up Germain, she tells the characters to continue pursuing Gara and that she can get help for herself. Okay, cool. So here we are going to need to address two things. Uh, one thing now and one thing later. The first thing that we need to do now is do we want to adjust the uh, difficulty of the trap that Gara set for the characters in her apartment? And I feel like the answer is yes, right? Uh, four Kenku cut purses. Now it doesn't have, now let's be clear. It doesn't have to be super difficult, right? Because they're going to be doing several different encounters. They've already fought the Knolls this same day. Um, they might have gotten into a bit of a scrap with Jass. They're probably going to end up here. And then, I am i don't know, I haven't read ahead, but they're probably going to, you know, run into more Dask members that they got to fight. So it doesn't have to be super hard. Four Kenku cut purses. Kenku R, CR one quarter. Yes, CR one quarter. I don't know that we necessarily need to really make it any more difficult than that. I don't know what you all think, but I mean, again, this is just, I mean, that's not true. I do think we should make it a little more difficult because this is the trap that Gara set in her apartment and it feels reasonable to me uh, that she would set, you know, a fairly dangerous trap for relatively experienced adventurers. Um, so we can definitely do something a little bit more than four Kenkus. What do we think should be waiting here? Um, let's have a look at, let's go to our months. Oh, I'm going to do monstrosity and humanoid in our, oh, I should move you all over so you can see what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to go back to D&D Beyond. I've set it to pull out humanoids and monstrosities and let's go let's keep it pretty narrow and easy let's just go see our one half to see our one and see what comes up right we're keeping this simple slightly more difficult than the kenkus not going to be a super deadly encounter for them because that's not the point of this right barovian witch um all right we want to keep it again we want to look for humanoids that could or monster you know people whatever that live that could be reasonably members of dask which is a drome nation of monsters or monstrous people whatever wow words are really failing me clearly i need some food and we're gonna end this probably in the next half hour to 45 minutes uh it's fine we're good for right now um so we need relatively intelligent society and language capable things so what are we looking at? Fire Newt, no, no, done it already. No, no, never, no, never, hardly ever. Wait, 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 hold on. I did, I missed your message before and I got to pull the chat back up. Uh, can Kenku's, can the Kenku's have watched a bunch of Sharn Broadway musicals? Oh my God, that's, that's really funny. Okay, so we might, we might include a couple of Kenku, uh, cause I love that. Let's see what else is here. Jackal wares. No, I don't want to mess with lycanthropes because that's a whole silver flame storyline that we'll save for later. Lizard folk. Meh. Locatha. No. What in the hell is a norker? Some sort of goblinoid. How bizarre. Hello, I'm back. What are we thinking? Hey, Ian, welcome back. Um, so right now we are, once again, uh, adjusting an encounter ever so slightly. We are currently working on, um, there's a an ambush trap set uh, in an apartment that the characters, the PCs will likely go to. Right now it's set for second level characters to be four Kenkus. Um, so it's a pretty easy encounter. They're going to be, there's the possibility of lots of fights in this adventuring day. So we don't want to kill them with this encounter. But I think I want something that's a little bit more challenging than four CR one quarter creatures. So we're just sort of looking, I've completely lost my place. We're just sort of looking uh, through the list of humanoids and monstrosities, CR one half to one. It's not a huge upgrade. Don't want to use orcs because uh, orcs are different right they're from elsewhere they they've we've got orc druids and gatekeepers in the eldian reaches so we don't want to go with that rust monsters monks ruffians um so who agains mm, i don't think so skulks thugs wargs zorbo no as much as i would love to 
Alright, we're at CR1 now, so getting a little, but this is as high as we'll go. Eblis, Evil Mage. I'm in an Eberron game next week on Scrat's channel. <clears throat> I really like Eberron take on orcs, as do I. Female Steeder, Giant Strider, Goblin Boss, Grung Wildling. That would be very funny, but no. Oh, we could do the Harpies here, I suppose. This feels like maybe a little bit of a better place for a Harpy, because, like, they could be there to cast... Because this is a trap that was set, right, by Gara, the lieutenant of this whole thing. So maybe the Harpies are there to sort of see if they can trap the PCs. This is an option. I like this. Let's think. Let's keep looking, but I like that possibility. Um, Harpies are fun. Harpy and Kenku. She's trying to get Kenku to sing her Broadway songs. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Terra Folk, Salida, Sound of Blood, Sea Spawn. Oh, we're back to the spy. Tabaxi. No. <laughs> when you made the... Oh, Fluffy's not here anymore. Fluffy made a bugbear joke earlier, and I was thinking of trying to, like, mash up a bugbear and some Thrycreen or something. I didn't I didn't understand the joke, because my brain was not firing on all cylinders. Um, okay, so I think let's toss in some harpies. I think that's the easy thing to do. Um, so let's, let me go back to bring y'all back. Uh, so this is, I can do it here. Um, where am I? This is uh, T, oops, T terminus, T4B uh, encounter. And we have assisting combatants. Oh, and what's their deal? They fight until what? Oh, this one. Okay, that's interesting. This one doesn't say anything about... Uh, about them fleeing. But I mean, again, it makes sense. These are cut purses that work for Dask. It makes sense to me that they would flee too. So I'm going to go ahead and say that just like the other, uh, the other encounters, these are going to fight until one, uh, one enemy left, we'll say. Um, and it originally was four Kenku, but we're going to do two Kenku and two Harpies. How does that sound, everybody? Um, again, not... Uh, oh, oh, we're having a whole conversation that I'm missing. Uh, two Dry Cloaks. Oh my god, she can't get a ticket to Alexander, so she keeps getting Kenkus to assemble the whole thing. So that that's, that's very funny. No, 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 I like this a lot. Um, I wish that this particular encounter was likely to be more like was likely to involve some role play although you never know with this group so maybe maybe they will maybe they'll hear singing coming from it i kind of like that actually um singing uh i love it okay so this feels good to me it doesn't feel overwhelmingly difficult we only upgraded half of them we didn't really change any stats on them uh this feels good to me and and honestly the harpies uh, a luring song or whatever it's called like that's a no joke ability so I feel good about this um, I don't particularly feel the need to upgrade the knoll that's burning the documents because that feels like something that a low level operative for Dask would be assigned to do I don't think there's any need to upgrade that knoll's stats any I know it'll be an easy fight if it comes to that but I'm not I'm not gonna actually worry about that um because sometimes I know like oh I've heard this conversation who was it oh I think Mike Shea Sly Flourish talks about this a lot that like um he actually probably would disagree with some of the changes that we've made here today but that's okay uh but he makes a good point that you know always making every encounter and every combat or otherwise that the characters uh run up against um always making them more difficult as the player's level sort of doesn't necessarily always make sense story and narrative wise. Like if a low level knoll is there burning documents, then a low level knoll is there burning documents. It doesn't matter if the characters are first level or 10th level, right? Like that's a job for a low level desk operative. So we leave it the way it is. Right. Um, and it's about like finding the balance there. Uh, Ian says uh, they could capture and get info from that knoll too. Yeah, absolutely. Like if they see this poor knoll there, maybe they're going to think, hey, let's knock him out and get info from him. That's a great point, Ian. Um, 
Great. Okay. So I think we're good with Gara's apartment. Um, lower level apartments. Okay. Uh, they can be empty. You roll a d12. They can be empty. They can have some commoners, a shifter, a warforged soldier, or a changeling. Uh, none of those people work for Dask, so we don't need to worry about adjusting their stats or worrying about that. You need a John Travolta Knoll, just a chumpy low-level crime person. Hilarious. That's, that is exactly who, uh, Noor is. That's the one that's burning the documents. I love that. I love that. Okay. Skybridge. Oh, now see? They're a step ahead of me. Should have known. This stone skybridge connects the tenement building to the building containing the lift. A Dask Harpy and a group of 1d4 commoners loiter on the bridge when the characters arrive. The commoners pose no threat, but the Harpy attacks the characters on sight using her luring song to bring them to her if they flee. I think I'm okay leaving this as a Harpy, even though we just saw some Harpies. Um... And again, I'm not... Well, you know what? Let's have a... Okay, let's do what we did here. Let's... Here, let me bring you back. Um, let's have a look at CR2 monsters. So slightly more difficult than a harpy. Uh, but not anything that's going to overwhelm... Particularly, this is just one of them. Not anything that's going to overwhelm a party of fourth-level adventures, right? Make it the harpy that runs away from the previous fight. Oh, that's an interesting thought, too. Let's have a look at this, and then if we don't find anything, or if we don't, if, because I, I, yeah, that's a good idea. It'll definitely be a harpy that runs, not a kenku, let's be honest. Those kenkus are going to die real quick. Um, Bindelhelm, apparently I need to read Mordenkainen's Fiendish Folio. Um, man, there's a ton. Oh, it's because there's humanoids in here, too. It's fine. <laughs> Ettercap, no. If I know I'm scrolling fast, but if y'all see anything, let me know. Grick, Griffin. No. Inspired? I don't know what any of those are. They're from Eberron. Anyway. Iron Console. Marrow. Mimic. It's just a mimic. It's a mimic that looks like a harpy. Um, <laughs> some orcs. Mm, could be an Orog, but I think I want some... I like... Eh, I'm not so interested in an Orog right now. Also, they're technically orcs, so we should leave them alone. Uh, the more I look, the more I like Ian's idea. But let's go ahead. We've only got two more pages, so let's go ahead and get through the list. Tortle Druid! Um... Where we're at. Oh, I don't want to mess with lycanthropes. Okay, so I think we're going to go with uh, with Ian's idea of uh, a harpy that flees from the previous battle. And frankly, if they manage to kill both harpies and neither of them flees, then they don't have this encounter later on. That's super fine with me. Um, that does mean... Uh, harpies fight until one enemy left. Until... Well, anyway, I'll know what that means. Um, yeah, okay, great. So we want to... Let me just make a note. Fleeing Harpy can be found in T6 Skybridge. There we go. Okay, great. I love that. That's a great idea. Thank you, Ian. All right, let's move forward. T7 Graffiti Hall. There is a hidden door with a peephole in it. Connects this area to the Dask Hideout. Character with a passive wisdom perception of 15 or higher notices it. Um, Dask shifter, shifter operative in T8 watches through the hall. Uh, watches the hall through the peephole. If they notice the characters, the creatures in T8 open the door. Excuse me, and attack. All right, Dask, let's finish this copy. Done. Um, all right, Dask hideout. Okay. So this is what would come out and attack. And now again, we're going to be... So we're going to adjust little bits. We don't want to make anything super killer difficult because they're obviously doing several encounters here as they go through Terminus. Uh, this one is two Dask operatives. A chaotic neutral shifter named Bartram and his warg companion are stationed here. Bartram and the warg are surly and never shy away from a fight. Uh, that said, they will happily leave the party alone 
if handed a bribe of 10 gold or more. Okay. So I think I'm going to, I think let's adjust this ever so slightly. Um, what did we do with the shifters from that previous? We turned the shifter into a bandit captain. Do we want to do that same thing again? Is that, is that a good trick that we can just keep using? So give them bandit captain stats and then leave the, and the warg can be the warg. It's a jump from one half to two. I don't hate that. How do we feel about that, friends? The other, another option might be upgrading the warg to maybe a dire wolf, like we did in, um, in the section where they were uh, saving, sorry, I'm just gonna fix this a little bit, where they were saving um, the kid uh, so that would be an upgrade from a CR one half warg to a CR one dire wolf. Uh, so that's also an option. What do we think? I feel like the bandit captain stats make a little more sense, honestly. And also just make for a more interesting, right? Because the, the bandit captain has some interesting mechanics. Um, warg versus dire wolf, I mean sort of the same thing. All right, I'm going to start typing that because usually what happens is I start to type it and then, uh, oh crap, I'm letting you all see pages of Last War. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> whoops. Uh, I'm going to start typing that because usually what happens is I type stuff and then you all come up with a better idea while I'm typing. So let's see how that goes. Uh, okay, so this is T... Eight uh, terminus. Oops. T eight. Oh hell. Encounter. And. Ex oops. I just realized that I butchered that word. There we go. Um. Can be bribed. Otherwise, fight to the death. Okay, and so we've got, let's just copy it from here. Oops, I know how computers work. I do love this idea that uh, Fluffy had about uh, using their teeth to when in shifted form to parry. Love that. Uh, and then we can leave the warg as is. Warg, that's fine. That's fine with me. Okay, we've only got five more uh, rooms of Terminus. So, T9, interrogation room. Corin Del Maco is a male like the halfling who works for the Boromar clan. The halfling tried to... Oh, fantastic. The halfling tried to infiltrate Dask and was captured. He's being held in the hideout while Dask agents torture him for information. Okay. So, two things to deal with here. One is that... Um, I'm going to have to change this a little bit because uh, it sounds like in the in the description of some of this, it sounds like maybe uh, Corrin is in the midst of being tortured. No, there's no one else in the room. Okay. One of the uh, veils that one of my players has is torture. Um, so we're not going to describe it in great detail on screen. It can happen as part of the story, but it happens off screen. So that's one thing that I want to make sure that I uh, keep in mind. So I'm just going to make myself a little note here. Terminus T9 encounter. Downplay on screen torture. Um, that's, I'll know what that means. Uh, okay, the second thing that we need want to talk about is since our party are agents of the Boromar clan. Do we want to tie them to Corrin in any more significant way? Um, do they already know Corrin? If so, we need to establish that earlier in the session, right? In the adventure, which is fine. Um, I mean, Corrin... Corrin could... Well... Okay, I'll say it out loud because I, I don't think I like the idea, but my instinct is that Corin could be 
their contact in the Boromar clan, right? Which we talked about earlier, which I think is on the other, yeah, it's on this other document, right? So their contact, uh, oh, part of it is cut off, so you can't really read it very well. I'll read it to you. But their contact in the Boromar clan is a former urchin who is now fabulously wealthy, who wants everyone to succeed. Uh, and you can see somewhere we wrote more about this person, but now I don't remember where. Oh, here it is. Um, yeah, so the urchin contact is a Doc Holiday type gambler extorted by the Boromars for work. She cheated at Three Dragon Ante because in her early part of her career, she was uh, she would cheat at at gambling games of chance, whatever, whatever, right? Um, <laughs> just saw this. Whoops. Uh, I just noticed that someone uh, from earlier sent me a whisper saying that the... Uh, the captions were still going, even though I'd muted my mic, which is good to know. Um, also, are we still, we are still online, right? Oh my God. Yeah, we're still, okay. For some reason, my quality meter on thing is, okay, great. For some reason, my quality meter is telling me that I'm offline, but it's fine. Um, anyway, moving forward. Uh, right, so do we, I mean, could... I don't, I don't think Corin is the urchin contact, right? I think that's a little, well, I don't know, maybe. It certainly makes, certainly pulls the, the party into this a little bit more deeply, right? Because um, this is their main contact person in the Boromar clan. I'm liking this more and more. Also, like, They'll definitely, they'll recognize him immediately. Now, why, now, how did he get here? Well, oh no, this is great. It's absolutely, it's absolutely uh, their contact. Okay, this is great. Wait, I'm excited about this. Because this also will, uh, oh, my brain, so many ideas. Okay, I think maybe, go with me on this for a moment. I think maybe... The meta arc of this campaign, oh, I should say, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, so this campaign that I'm starting, one of the reasons that uh, we chose to go with Eberron and for the party to be operatives of the Boromar clan is because we can run it uh, a little bit like asynchronously or non-chronologically. One of the problems that this group has run into, particularly lately, because we've all got busy schedules, and then now because everything is weird scheduling-wise with everything going on, um, we normally have a two-player out rule where if two or more people are not able to make uh, game night then we don't play the main campaign um, but we want to find a better way to deal with that and so what we came up with was that I'm going to run this campaign uh, sort of non-chronologically so if two people are missing or even if one person is missing uh, and we're in the middle of an adventure right that involves all of the characters well that week I'll run a different mission that the Boromar clan sent the party on or sent part that part of the party that's able to be there on. Um, and one thing that Fluffy and I were talking about earlier is that we can use that non-chronological uh, format to sort of layer in some intrigue and some mystery that as we close the time loop and sort of understand the order in which things happen um, might, you know, reveal some things to the players. Now, obviously there's logistical problems, right? Because I'm not going to make the characters jump around level and stuff. And if they've leveled and, you know, I'm just going to, they're just going to have to go with that, right? They're going to have to suspend their disbelief a little bit. Uh, if something that ends up being something that happened, you know, six months earlier, but they were higher level, like eh, they'll just have to deal with that. It's fine. Um, all of that to say, I think maybe the meta arc of this campaign, the thing that ultimately ties everything together, is this thing that we talked about at the very beginning of this planning stream, which is that there are some turncoats in the Boromar clan, some moles, some some traitors, some whatever you want to call them, right? And they're really causing trouble for, Bo for the Boromar in a way that, like, ultimately, as the campaign progresses, has the potential to really destabilize the entire organization. And so maybe we don't know who those people are. Maybe that's, okay. 
So that is our big meta arc, in which case it's really important that this Corin person is our contact because that he can talk about, you know, he, he, nobody should have known that he was involved. He, one of the deals that he made with the Boromars when, when they extorted him to work for them was that he would have, uh, you know, his contact with them would be extremely limited and, you know, dead drops and that kind of stuff so that he would have, it would be very difficult for anyone to link him to the organization. And so the fact that people knew that he not only works for the Boromar, but gave the party this particular mission and so had knowledge of it, that fact means something really strange is going on. And hopefully the players and the party will figure that out. I like this a lot. Okay, so let's, um, let me check one thing. Thing. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so is our <laughs> is our urchin contact's name Corin? Corin. Let's call him Corin. I like that. Great. I love that. Uh, you know what? Let's do it here. I don't know if that's how you spell Corinne with two R's. Sure. Uh, Corinne Del Naco. You can keep the name. That's totally fine. Um, very limited clandestine contact with Boromar. Great. That's all we need to know there. And then we can go... Sorry. <laughs> that was probably awful to watch. Uh, we can go back up here to say that Corin is the party's contact within the Boromar clan. Okay, so there are some things that Corin knows and says that we're going to have to adjust since he is someone that the party knows. Um, although I'm not sure they've ever met him in person. Oh, that could be really exciting. I like that. <laughs> plan. Uh... They've never met him in her in person, so they won't immediately recognize her. Oh, I like that. Great. Um, okay, so this says lawful evil spy. Well, she's not evil, but it's fine. Whatever. Uh, following racial traits, fine. Corn claims I have no idea why Dask abducted her and begs for the characters to free her. Character who succeeds on an insight check contested by Corrin's deception check knows the halfling is lying. If pressed, Corrin admits her connection to the Bormar clan, tells the characters it would mean a lot to the powerful halfling family if they freed her. Character can untie Corrin, untie Corrin from the chair as an action. She flees the scene, tells the Bormars of the rescuers, which could lead to more adventures. Well, it's going to. Um, so, cool. I like this a lot. So, um, rather than rather than talking, like, lying about why... Uh, she mentions that she has no idea how they found her, knew she was involved with the Boromars, much less with this particular uh, 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 mission, let's say. Um, <laughs> this is why I went, oh, I hate this, but went straight. Um, yeah, okay, that gives me some ideas there. Okay, hey, I'm excited about that, tying it into the meta arc. Love it, love it. All right, we're almost done with Terminus, and then I think that's probably where we'll uh, wrap for today, because I am getting hungry and my brain is being sluggish. Um, all right, but let's get through this, because I'm very excited about it. So, what are you looking at right now? Good, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Excellent. T10, Terminus Station Lift. It goes up to the higher levels of the district. Fine. T11, Bodega. Well, that just made my life. This store, this store sells is run by... Okay, that's a typo. It's fine. This store is run by Gertie, an elderly Kenku. If the characters ask Gertie about Gara, the Kenku mimics the half-ogre's voice, saying, my coach is leaving soon. Hurry it up or I'll pluck ya, stupid bird. Great, that can stay the way it is. T12 Ticket Booth, 
Uh, don't need to worry about anything here. There's some information, but nothing needs to be adjusted for my party. T13, bathroom. Thank you for including a bathroom. Because everybody's got to go. Everybody poops. The bathroom contains six stalls, each with a toilet, three hoof foot high pillar at the center of the room with a cleansing stone embedded in its top. Good, very good. Wash your hands. 20 seconds. T14, station platform. Okay. Oh, no. Yes, sort of. Okay. The sound of the lightning rails. Oh, I'm not reading the box text. A crowd of 2D10 commoners, 2D4 nobles gather on the platform along with six hostile human bandits who belong to Dusk. The bandits are here to cover Gar's escape and attack the characters who try to board the departing train. To catch Gara, the characters need to board the lightning rail train leaving the station. Coach has 10 cars. A helm car at the front, first class car, galley car, dining car, two standard cars, two sleeper cars, a steerage car, and a cargo car at the rear. Whatever. Fine. The characters have 30 seconds, five rounds, to catch the coach before it leaves Terminus Station. A character can jump onto a lightning rail car by making a successful athletics check. Character who fails, takes some bludgeoning damage, and falls prone on the platform. Hilarious. At the start of round six, the coach moves 20 feet per round for three rounds before accelerating to top speed. Left at the station, if none of the characters board the lightning rail train, Gara gets away. A more likely scenario is that one or more characters are left behind while the rest have boarded the train. <laughs> In this case, keep the initiative order and alternate between the characters stuck on the platform with the Dask Bandits and the characters exploring the train. Characters who remain at the station can seek out an adventurous Skycoach driver and bribe them to fly after the train before making a de uh, dexterity acrobatics check to leap onto the roof of a train car safely. Characters who fail the check take... Uh... Oh, wow. Typos, typos. Characters who fail the check fall prone on the roof of the car and take bludgeoning damage based on the distance fallen. Okay. Uh, I'm just... There's six bandits. I'm going to upgrade one of them to a bandit captain and call it a day, I think. Uh, because they're not really... They're just about delaying the party, right? Um, yeah. So we're just going to do that. Unless someone has another idea, which, of course, I'm happy to hear. But... What area is this? T14. Um, but yeah, for my money, we're just going to Terminus T14 encounter. Um, yeah, for my money, oops. Delay characters at all costs. Uh, normally we have six human bandits. We're gonna turn them into one bandit captain and five bandits. Easy peasy, not too complicated. Again, happy to hear other ideas, but that is a solid solution for me for right now. Great, okay. That is the end of the Terminus section. The only things we have left here for this adventure is uh, the lightning rail uh, encounter bits, which is where they're going to confront Gara as the uh, as the lightning rail is going, and then the conclusion, and then we will go back to uh, deal with some other things that we sort of left. If you remember, we left the um, we left this encounter to have more information on what happens next to tie it into the rest of the campaign. Was there there might have been something else? Oh no, we ended up going with. Um, we end up going with Corin for this one. Um, okay, so I am going to... I think I will get back on tomorrow to do sort of the rest of this adventure and this tie-in stuff. Probably be about the same time. Sometime between, like, I don't know, noon 30 and 2, I'll start. Um, if you're not already following, go ahead and hit the follow button. Because, A, I'm trying to get to 50. Woohoo! But also, you'll know when I go live to do this planning tomorrow. So you all can help me finish out uh, adjusting the rest of Forgotten Relics and planning the next step of the campaign. Um, this has been super fun. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Um, if you are new to, to me and, and to my stuff, um, I do have an actual play podcast uh, that is not this group of people. Uh, it's called The Last Refuge. You can check us out. Uh, info in the chat. Um, also, I occasionally, I mean, tomorrow I'll be streaming more prep for this, but I also occasionally uh, stream video games, Dragon Age and Neverwinter and other stuff. Uh, here on this channel. So if you're into any of that stuff, definitely follow as well. Um, that's all from me for now. 
thank you all so, so much for your help. Uh, thanks for all of your ideas. I'm super excited about this. I will definitely tell the, the group uh, that I had help in planning some of this stuff. I really appreciate you. I hope to see you guys tomorrow uh, if you're available and around while I finish up this planning. Thanks so much. Hit the follow button if you haven't already. Check out my podcast. Um, stay safe. Stay home as much as you possibly can. Stay healthy. And uh, that's all I got. Happy gaming, y'all. I don't have an end screen, so I'm just going to end the stream. Anyway. Uh, Bye.